Um, not, uh, do you have a motion to, well, I mean, I don't know, do we need a motion to table the swearing in of the commissioners, I assume, or do we just not do that? We have no way to do that. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think you you can just as chair make notes that, okay. so we, um, yeah, that, that is going to be handled when you read from me, not to the recent. Okay. So we will swear in their, the new commissioners when we reconvene. Uh, can everybody please rise and face the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, John, could you please call the roll? Here, Mike Brody. Here, Mike Brody. Here. We have a quorum of three. Um, all right. Uh, we're going to. So, do we have a motion to table the election of the mayor and vice mayor? Motion to table. Oh, uh, yeah. Go ahead and do that. Now, because you probably need to make a motion to suspend the rules to allow debate participation yep. by the officials that have been elected but not sworn in. Do okay. so we have a motion to table? Do a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, let me pass it. Do we have a motion to suspend the rules to allow for the uh, unsworn in commissioners to participate in the debate? Motion. All favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. So, welcome. <laughs> All right, you can move on to a motion to approve the November 17th public hearing meeting minutes. Motion to approve. Wait. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes, hi. Uh, motion to approve the November 17th City Commission meeting minutes. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Item 10 is a motion to approve the December 15th, 2022 City Commission meeting agenda. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And you guys are going to kind of get a rhythm over there. <laughs> all we got. All right. Announcements from Commissioner. Commissioner Clark. Uh, happy holidays to everyone, and uh, it's been a good year here. I think it's great. I'll be another one in 2024. Perfect. Uh, I must compliment the city once again, City Manager John Wallace, and all the employees for this fabulous event Sunday at the park. The uh, holiday tractor extravaganza was major, majorly impressive. Um, went, put great amount of time and energy. Everyone was quite blown away. Loved the layout, loved the stage, loved Santa. Thank you all so much. And I mean, you can see what's out there helping out. So um, that just really shows, I think it represented what we are as a community. I really love that. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, well, uh, I, I suppose we can still have received some input from the, the newly elected commissioner. So I'm uh, going to have a happy holiday to everybody here. First, happy new year. Nearly almost about it. Almost a lot. Yeah, I'll just want it. Almost more here. That's close. Yeah. Um, Merry Christmas. Glad to be here. Thank you. This year. And I'll, I will uh, just say what Glenn said again, too. The, the Christmas uh, event was fantastic. The staff you guys did an amazing job out there. I mean, it was amazing how fast they got it set up, torn down, uh, how many people came out for it. It was just uh, one of the best things. That was the thing. Anything the city ever done, other than maybe the the uh, night out? That that that's probably close, isn't it? No, 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 is uh, Debbie Yoho, I believe. Uh, you can just say, step up to the, the podium and state your name and address, and you have uh, the ear of the commission. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Debbie Yoho. I live down here on Ellerslie Way. Um, and, and I have a problem. And I mentioned this problem when uh, the sewer people were here. And so when I mentioned that, then I had to turn around and deal with it again on Thanksgiving Day. I woke up to sewage in my bathrooms, in my commodes, in my sinks, and um, and that was Thanksgiving Day. We do not have Thanksgiving, of course, because of that very thing. I began calling people 
early in the morning and continue to call people throughout the day. And um, no one answered me until late afternoon, right before dark. So my daughter proceeded to call someone from, um, from a, a town, from Nashville, to come and see if they could do something about my sewer problem. And so they did finally come to care of it after dark. My concern is that no one answered. And those were those were numbers that you're supposed to call if you have an emergency. And I don't know what you guys were doing on Thanksgiving, but my emergency was watching sewer come up into my bathtub in my sink, and I couldn't run water, and I couldn't even finish my Thanksgiving dinner. So um, I'm just a little concerned, mainly because the person that came out to do my that we did get to come out and do the sewer charged me four hundred and six dollars that day, and also. Uh, Mr. Um, Parker came and kind of looked at the situation today. And if you have anything to say about it, I don't know. Yeah, yesterday, I went over a little bit. Um, I talked with her on the phone. <clears throat> I didn't really remember any of it happened on Thanksgiving Day or whatever. But anyhow, I went out there. She said they bumped. So I just went out, spoke with her. Open the tank to see if it had been pumped. I think it's been pumped now. Yeah, I think you stated that it had been pumped in July of 21 also. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes, that was the day of my husband's funeral. Um, and it was it magic funeral. Yeah, magic funeral. You know, I didn't find anything. I'm not sure why it was backing up in her house. I wouldn't think it was already full unless it was clogged or something like that. It's about all I knew of as of yesterday. My concern is that in the future, I mean, when I spoke uh, when the sewer people, when y'all were talking about the sewer before, was that um, people don't answer their telephone. I don't understand. If, if they're on call for emergency, I don't know about you guys, but that was kind of an emergency to me. Watching sewer come up into my drinks and not being able to use water or flush the commode or do anything else. And by the way, I had only been home from the hospital for a week. So I, I, I just need some assurance that if this happens again, which obviously it's going to, because I thought this is the second time it happened, what do I do? I just need answers. And, and I would like some of my money back as well. Mr. Mayor, if I could clarify the there was a call back three hours and two minutes after the initial call was made. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for making us aware of the situation. All right. Uh, our next item is, uh, is uh, Mr. Bill Rodgers. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I'm Bill Rogers, 1660 South Harvard Road. I know that a lot of y'all are familiar with me over the years with the bridge situation and, and now the uh, erosion control situation. I am a non resident of uh, Kingston Springs. I live out on, uh, on the border of, of Kingston Springs. So, uh, uh, I really appreciate you letting me address you gentlemen, since I am a non-voting member from uh, uh, the council. Uh, I've got a stack of communications uh, over the uh, golf club of BBI uh, that, that I'm certainly not going to go through. But I, and I was certainly pointed out by a letter and uh, uh, from the city planner. Uh, that was forwarded to me December 12th. That uh, at the last meeting, the planning commission meeting, I was there and addressed, uh, had two minutes to uh, uh, quickly uh, address the uh, planning commission. Uh, 
and she pointed out that several residents living outside the jurisdictional boundaries of the town of Kingston Springs stated objections during the public forum to the recent violations of the Kingston Springs Regional Planning Commission meeting on December 8th during that time. So uh, we're very familiar that we're not members of Kingston Springs, but I've also got a long letter here from of uh, December 13th from the city planner telling me everything that the city of Kingston Springs cannot do. It's really enjoyable to read this on what you cannot do. But the problem is the town of Kingston Springs, quoting the town of Kingston Springs and the Kingston Springs Regional Planning Commission have no authority, and I granted I agree with this totally, to enforce compliance outside the jurisdiction of the town lying within the boundary of Cheatham County. The city attorney has been very clear on this point. But us people that live in the county, you are our problem. You are the one that are, is putting debris and silt into my beautiful river. You have muddied my beautiful road. You have filled all the ditches in. No way for the water to get out. Go down there and look at it. If any of y'all would go over there and look at it, I really would appreciate it. It's not a hard time to see the water sitting in the ditches. All the cross drains are full. They've been stopped up. All because of the city of Kansas Springs. And you throw back on me that you have permits and y'all are, with, with our, uh, uh, fulfilling the permits. And I pulled up TDEX when they pulled the violation on that. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's some of the most beautiful drone pictures I've ever seen from 500 feet up in the air of pollution, uh, temporary erosion control. It's beautiful. That's what you guys are seeing, but you're not seeing what I'm living with. We don't live in that area of those beautiful uh, uh, silt fences that are put in perfectly. I, I, I did this for a living, so I know how they're supposed to be put in. They've done a great job of using wire back erosion control fences, which is a very expensive erosion control fences. And it's put in very properly. Believe me, I've walked the areas that I could walk and I've checked. Uh, but on our side that you're not seeing, there are holes underneath. We've sent pictures. Yeah. There are holes underneath the silt fence where the water's going through. The water's going around the silt fence. It's not containing on our side. The beautiful pictures you're seeing, let me tell you, they're pretty. I mean, I, I, you could put them in a book and, and sell them and you would be uh, making a million. Okay. Uh, this quote from uh, the city planner also on December 7th, this project has uh, occurred over four to three years. And I think somebody here quoted that. It might have been John, three and a half years. Well, the construction, granted, y'all have had this headache for three and a half years going through all the permits. But the construction had been going on maybe nine, 10 months. And during those nine or 10 months, we had a drought. Us farmers know that during this, we had good spring rains, no rain. Until September 1st, we had a two to three inch gully washer. That was the first big erosion problem we had. We've had four of them, four blowouts. Uh, that was the first one. Uh, I, uh, I do not understand during the planning commission meeting, y'all voted to uh, let the contract continue. You lifted the shutdown order that, that was so rightfully done by the city to shut down that operation because on the 29th we had mud. And you, you know, I was, I was quoted that the city is in really close communications with Robert Hester, the county road superintendent, who does a great job, and with uh, the the uh, golf club of DBI. I got a call from one of my neighbors early that morning, about 7.30, that there was a mudslide that covered the road. Well, 
I had other things to do, believe it or not, even though I'm retired, I did have other things to do. And I couldn't get out there until 11 o'clock. I got out there at 11 o'clock, golf course at DVI, and the, the contractor that they've assigned now since Civil left them was out there working. They had a backhoe, a, a skid steer, and a dump truck cleaning the roads up. I've got pictures of it. They did a great job uh, of cleaning up the debris that they put in the road. At 11 o'clock or 11.30, and I'd have to look on my phone, I called Robert Hester of Cheatham County. Somebody in your organization has told me that y'all stay in really close communication with him. He said, I've never heard about this blowout. Evidently, there is a letdown somewhere because nobody called Cheatham County Highway Department about coming out there. Now, they came out there the next day. They worked two days cleaning up the ditches and, and finishing up with the golf club, did not clean up. Uh, kudos to them. He, he did a great job, but he doesn't have the money right now to fix it back the way it should do. So we still have the ditches that are sitting there. Anyway, let's go on with it because you're going to shut me out of here. Just a minute. I need to move on. There's, there's a... We know you have a bond to fix this road. Uh, I've been told that many times. Is that money fifty thousand dollar bond or whatever to fix the road? That's no, that's a county bond. bond. Just to, for clarification, that's a county. Not anyway, a county. It, okay, thank you. It, whatever somebody's got a bond to fix my road, and that that patching of those roads is. It, I'll go with it. I've got a. Uh, I'm on their agenda. Thank you for them letting me on your agenda, and you not letting me on your agenda tonight. Uh, uh, don't understand why, but I appreciate you letting me stay here and talk. Anyway, there are four things, in my opinion, and, and, and you can blame it on the county. You can say, oh, that's a county, that's a county, that's a county, but no, you caused it. The city of Kingston Spring caused this problem. You allowed them to come out there and destroy that road, and uh, it's, 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 it all comes back to, no, the liability is with you. The county, uh, we've got a, 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 we need a bridge. God, I hate to say that because we're just going to get a bridge finished here in May 31st, hopefully this year. We need a bridge where that low water creek is, gentlemen, and why the city or county, whoever, everybody's going to blame on somebody else, didn't require a bridge there. I'll never know. It's That's where the, the 60% of the of the debris is right where that creek is right there. We need a bridge there. Anything you can help with us, with the county, I'm, I'm hurting. I'm hurting. Uh, ditches and cross drains, that's county, but you cost water retaining structures on your property, on the Kingston Springs. I don't understand how the, uh, we have a lot of temporary traffic control out there. A lot of it's faulty, a lot of it's beautiful. Uh, we've got one retainage pond that has been built out there on our side of the property. It's classic, it's beautiful. It's built according to anybody's drawing. It is right next to the entranceway. It goes in down there. It is a perfect place for anybody to say, hey, T-Deck, look at what we do. But there's also three other areas down through there that have blown out that have caused all the muck, that have got little bitty uh, rose control fences and some cigar fences through there that aren't working. So my question is, what happens when we finish this job? Now, Jeff has said in some of his writings that don't worry about it. When the sod gets seeded and all this, everything's gonna settle down. Still, gentlemen, we're going to have massive runoff there because they have cleared 150, 250. I don't know how many acres they've cleared up there. But all that's got to dump down into these gullies. Uh, best I can tell, there's been no retainage ponds set up for those gullies. This is not as much money as these people have put into erosion control. Gobs of money. Retainage ponds not much money. We need to add some. They might be added. I'm not. I, I'm not the uh, 
Yeah, anyway, I'm sorry, Tony. I've drugged on a little bit too long. Well, well, that, that, and I appreciate you. I'm glad you have your time to speak. And I, I feel like when we get to staff, you're going to have a lot of questions answered for you. There was a site review done today. So, in I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm being conducted by the that's, a, that's another reason why I don't understand. There's two things I really don't, that really bothered me. Why can't the y'all were elected by not me but your constituents? You got to let your constituents participate, and nobody could participate in any of this. I cannot go out there and show. It's so simple for me to go and show people where the problem is, but no, we can't let the public participate. That's asinine to me. The next thing is, I don't understand how this commission can allow anybody that might belong to the golf club of Tennessee and a little quick, little quirk of legality, the golf club of BBI, ever vote on whether you open back up the anything that has to do with the golf club. I can't imagine how legally a person or multiple people are allowed to do that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, we've had that. Uh, we will move on to department reports, which I think will go kind of directly into stone. Do you have anything you'd like to start with? Uh, just real quick, I, I appreciate the, the kudos to the staff for the, the Christmas news. As Chief said, we, uh, with the Santa pictures and everything that we've seen, we estimated about 4,000 people attended the event at the park on Sunday. So um, very nicely done. I do believe Chief has something really quick, and then the planner has an update and a report to present. I do. Um, so Tennessee has awarded a violent crime grant, and they've set aside dollars. Like our town is eligible for up to sixty-three thousand dollars. I had to, but today the fifteenth, I had to submit an uh, intent to apply. So I've not applied for it. It's not matching funds. It's a hundred percent. But we'll apply for it in January. Um, we'll get a lot of clarification from the police chief association last week of what all that money can be used for, which is a much broader category than what it originally was looking like. So we have submitted to them that it is our intent to apply for the grant. And so that's the only thing that's been sent. Um, but I do plan to try to submit for the grant in January. I just want to make you aware it's not even matching funds. Um, so 100%. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then are we going to move on to, I believe, the report? And, and, and briefly, I, I think, uh, uh, Sharon, if you could explain. Maybe if you can, just because that is probably a question why it's probably not acceptable for members of the general public to be on private property while the inspection is going on. I think that might help me clear up some things. The general public, this is private property. The city has no authority to allow members of the general public to go on that property. That has to be done as the owner of the property. Otherwise, it's seen as trespassing. So in our visit today, we had that discussion with the entities at the Golf Club of DBI who have stated unequivocally they do not want members of the public conducting inspections on their property or doing site visits. Never been on their property. You drive so, down the road, though. If I may, I'm sorry, Mr. Rogers, if I may. But that's why um, that was not allowed. We don't have any authority to allow someone to go on private property who is a member of the public. Secondarily, I want to address a couple of things tonight. You have some information in your packet um, that is providing you with a timeline, very brief one, and the entities involved in this project. The site visit today um, was lengthy, muddy, and complexly done. Um, Franklin Wilkinson, Chief and Tony Building Official, joined us today. He joined us in two capacities. He is a building official for Cheatham County. He is also the city building inspector. 
I invited Franklin to go because there are issues resident within the county that they need to address. Uh, we do have an acknowledgement in your packet from Mayor McCarver that that is the case as well. We also have a copy of the inspection report results. A couple of things. Within the regulations for the control of stormwater and solar erosion, that is that reside with the state of Tennessee in the issuance of an NPDES permit, which is a stormwater pollution permit, and an ARAT with an alteration of a water body. Those two permits are separate entities. Within those regulations, SWIPS, which is the Stormwater Prevention Pollution Plan, and the site plans that are submitted to TDAC for approval and issuance of notice coverage, which if you'll all remember was handled in a public hearing uh, by TDAC, not by the city, but by TDAC that conducted that public hearing. That is not said in an attempt to absolve the city of responsibility for inspections and compliance. We do have that responsibility. But within those plans, unless there is demonstrated evidence of a previous event, they are required to design their plans for grading at a two-year storm event. We now know from two occurrences, one that began in October of 2022, that was the subject of a TDAC notice of violation to the Gulf Club and BBI and correction uh, that was ordered by TDAC on the site was completed and inspected and their notice of violation was issued. We had an additional incident exactly two weeks later where there were three breaches of the solar erosion controls that had just been installed. That was the reason for the visit today, site visit, because even though all of this was installed, Mr. Rogers is correct, it's installed very well, it's lovely, but it's insufficient to contain the water. And that's where every engineer's question lies. Where's the water gonna go? How can it contain it? So we walked that entire perimeter today to investigate where the water breached, where it stalled at the properties across the road, where it entered the roadway, and the efforts of the county to clean some of the ditches. Um, Mayor McCarver also indicated that further work would be done in the ditches. We have another issue within the county on the road surface itself. At one of the locations where it was breached, the culvert going under the road is a six inch culvert. It's insufficient to contain that level of stormwater. We also have two pipes that are 24 inch, but they are overwhelmed by the debris within the ditch before the water ever gets to the, to the pipe to carry it through. Is that so, a, is that debris from the first from from these incidents now, or is that pre-existing debris? Some of it is pre-existing. There's a lot of slippage, and you can see from the embankment that was inspected today. And I walked the site with the EPST engineer on site, uh, civil engineering, and it traverses up the slope of the bank of the ditch for about four feet. That is evidence that it occurred before because it's deeply embedded. It was not washed out during the storm. It remains there. So that is natural slope. <clears throat> Removing all the trees from the site, grading it, not stabilizing it, uh, created the traverse of those slopes. The slopes are pretty steep at the back side. In addition, there's storage of material outside of the area it's identified on the grading plan that is backstock and it's filled. It's been removed from the scalp off the ridge and done the blasting. It's largely shot rock, but there are some loose materials and debris on that pile. They were instructed today to remove them because it's right up against the edge of the road. It is not a naturally occurring outcropping. It's a result of cutting and clearing the ground and the trees and blasting, and it was disposed of there because it's not part of the project material to put it back. So they've been instructed to do that. Secondarily, I don't have the authority without planning commission approval to require them to submit a plan in compliance with a 25 year storm event. Planning commission has to direct that activity, but we are allowed under ordinance to do so once there's been a breach. There have been two breaches so far, so we can require that level. That will produce a higher grade of solid erosion. They have also been advised they need to rip wrap the steep slopes going down to the road, but the soil is not going to hold. I can see the riling all the way through it on the side today. All of this was observed by not only myself, but the EPSC engineer assigned to monitor the project, the city manager, and the building official from Cheatham County. So the plan going forward is threefold. We're going to increase the requirements of soil and erosion control and stormwater control. 
the creek that Mr. Rogers refers to, and he has a relevant point. It's the dividing boundary between DBI's property, which is in the city, and the adjacent property, which is in the county, that creek. When the incident occurred in October, that was the subject of the notice of violation from TDAC, that occurred not on the edge of the road. It occurred far away up the top of the hill where Stan was stored for the project. It washed out, entered the creek along with dirt and other debris, then washed out and filled up the ditches in a specific area for a length of about 65 feet. Uh, that's what the county dug out and removed. However, the county understands that digging out what's there now is a stopgap measure. We have advised the county and the building official who is taking that back to their planning commission that they need a set of plans for the improvements to that road that are necessary to carry this project. At the time that they submitted a bond uh, to cover the road, uh, construction and damage to the road. And it's a three quarter of a million dollar bond that's housed with Robert Fesser, who is the road superintendent. When I stated in my information to this commission, we don't have the authority, we don't see that, that jurisdictional line. We can't cause anything to happen. All we can do is make suggestions and encourage them to partner with us in order to handle this issue. The mayor has conceded that that is an issue for the, the county and the county mayor and agree to work with us and with his planning commission in order to get this done. We don't have any authority to place control on that roadway or the ditches, but we do have the authority within the jurisdiction of the city. We will increase what they're required to submit to us for plans so that we can design a storm water. And this was engineered reviewed by an engineer who's not only certified in the discipline, he's also a certified floodplain engineer. So it was reviewed, but in the period of time, it's it's no excuse. I'm not excusing anybody. There's been that sort of statement made as well. I'm not presenting anybody's point of view except the facts. When the rain event occurred, it was a great deal of rain, it's three and a half inches according to the hydrograph, which I checked on the National Weather Service. I'm an investigator by nature. I'm a researcher by nature. I'm taking anybody's word for anything. I look. So that three and a half inches fell in slightly over four hours. That's a great deal of water, a lot of water, a heavy rain, and the hill simply could not absorb it. So we have advised them what their steps forward. We will formalize that once the planning commission gives us permission to seek a 25-year storm event. It's a relatively simple, straightforward process for the designing engineer. We have also instructed them that a site monitor will be placed by the planning commission at their next meeting. So regular site visits can occur. If it's not directed by the city or by the, the planning commission, we can't just randomly go on the site. Someone has to require it. It has to be required because of an incident that occurred, in this case, two incidents. So that will be done. Uh, we will also work with the county to establish some requirements from their end of it for the roadway surface so that it doesn't go on the other side. I have seen scalding across the road, and I see Mr. Parker shaking his head. There has been scalding. Scalding is what the ground looks like with water moving very rapidly. He works this road and goes on the other side, so there's some scalded areas on the property surrounding that. The disposition in the creek was the subject of a notice, a notice of violation. That creek convert was down the hill. It's the boundary between the two jurisdictions. We get to weigh in on part of it. The county has to weigh in on the other part of it. It then goes under the road, across, down, and behind the properties that are being affected. So there was a great deal of salt and sand that was deposited there at that time. So this has been breached twice at almost the same location. So uh, that's what I have for you tonight, so we are addressing it. Um, we're addressing it in an appropriate fashion with the appropriate people that are decided to do that. We have made a request to TDAC on multiple occasions that they come out and view that end of the project because we specifically asked today, has TDAC visited <clears throat> this particular area? Is this particular area the subject of a notice of violation that was issued in October? It is not. So TDAC has not visited that site. 
We are now being told they're making limited field visits. Is that what you understood because of working from home and COVID protocols again, which leaves us in a deficit? Because normally TDAC does inspections every two weeks. It provides reports, which are on their website, which we can have access to. This is they've now implemented a work from home schedule again. They're not doing them. I see, I see Mr. Parker not his head again. It places a burden on the city in order to get this done, which is why we're going to put a site monitor there because TDAC cannot perform the duties for their permits because they are not in the field at this point. They're all working from home. So that places an additional hardship on us, but we'll find a way to handle it. So, a few non -secondary questions. Pardon me? I've got a few non secondary questions here. Certainly. Um, but the last thing that I want to state before I close this is that Franklin and I will have another conversation early next week to determine uh, their planning commission meets on the 5th of January. We will be present at that meeting, Franklin and I both. We're going to invite Mr. Hester. Mr. Hester is an elected official, he does a very fine job in accounting. But no one under, on planning commission has any control over the operations of the, the road superintendent within the county of Idaho. So that is my report. And if someone has questions, I'll be happy to answer them. That was yeah. Yeah. Um, is the check dam anywhere similar to a retained pond, or is, is, is that going to be sufficient enough? Retinge ponds are in the process of being constructed on the property. They appear on the plan set. Um, and I want to address something really briefly, too. There have been a couple of uh, records requests. The records are so large and voluminous that it was impossible to email them, which means they have to be hard copied. Um, so we'll try to answer that as well. But those plan sets, if they're reduced to 11 by 17, they're illegible, and so you can't see enough detail on those plans. Uh, they were provided to the city by Dropbox because the city system will not accept plan sets that large. And there are paper copies, but if you get paper copies, then they have to be recopied so they don't hand out ours. But to answer your question, Commissioner Hart, there are three retinage areas on the plan. Uh, some of them are under construction. I also heard about the bridge over the creek that is on the plan. It's just not in project, progress right now, but there is a bridge over that creek. So will there be some something lying on the side that was that was Okay. So, so there was a break. Now there's just the, the cigar and the, and the, and the well, right cigar. Well, the cigars that are out there now are insufficient. They are insufficient to control the flow. The applicant has been advised of that today. Okay. Um, site visits have to be done in a particular fashion in order for them to hold up. And we do that by scheduling. We do that by declaring what we're going to look at. And we do that by Frankly, it's a it's a rough construction site coming in the construction entrance, so we had to wait until they had vehicles available we could get out there. It's you can't traverse it in a regular vehicle or a pickup truck. It requires an ATV to get out there. That was done today. So they have been advised what next steps are and when those are coming. And um, I don't think it rises to the level of an emergency planning commission meeting at this point because insufficient advertising would occur. Very difficult to perform at Christmas. Um, but when the next planning commission meets, the second Thursday in January. In the meantime, they have installed fiberglass bass, bat mesh, and straw. In my opinion, it's going to hold over the next hard rain, and it won't. And so I can see the rain all the way through the site now. So they are taking steps. Um, they're working today. We walked in amongst the construction today to address these issues. Is there a time span for them to remove that? I guess that big waste pile that water was just kind of going around like a levy. Why did you explain it? The waste pile is going to require them to amend their permit. That takes time to amend the permit. Planning Commission has to approve it, which is the reason why I want to approve it the next Planning Commission meeting. So anytime you change plans that are approved and submitted to the Planning Commission, Kingston Springs does not allow staff to make those decisions or those approvals. So I have to take it back to the planning commission after it's advertised publicly. And then the planning commission can allow them to alter the plans that are in place now. So we can't change that just with staff direction. It has to go back to the state. And the PC hears it and determines whether or not there's sufficient reason 
for them to offer that plan based on staff reports that are done. Is the deal of the Cheatham County bond, their $758,000 bond, is only for the road only? It's for the road and the ditches and the right of way. It's my understanding. I haven't personally read it. I'm just repeating what's been told me by um, the developer in this case who supplied the bond. It was disclosed to us because it was one of my first concerns with the project and the planning commission's first concern with the project was where are you taking this material out? Where are you bringing material in? Because they're, they're saying you're not taking it through the existing golf course, which I understand would destroy the road and all of the things there. And they just thought they would be taking it out in that direction. And then the next question that logically surfaces is who's going to take care of the mess that's going to create for all those dump trucks and the ditches and the dirt. And at that point, we were assured, and then it would reiterate today, there's a $750,000 surety bond in place. So Kings and Springs, we don't have a surety bond at all for it. We need don't have for the road, no, but no, we need to have sole and erosion control bond and performance bond in the form of the surety right. from Travelers Insurance in place. Okay. So that was acquired during the planning commission process and furnished by the developer. Is there an amount on that or? It is, I believe, uh, Commissioner, I have to check, but John, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood between two hundred fifty and three hundred thousand dollars my best I remember. And it's for solid erosion work and for the storm work. They have not yet bonded because we're not at the point of permitting for the bridge structure. It's been keep in mind that part of this it's a long discussion, but I want everybody to be fully informed. The permit that was issued was a parcel permit. We did not have easement agreements between the Golf Club of Tennessee and the Golf Club of DBI for the Golf Club of Tennessee to have a pump house and other structures that they needed for their facility on DBI property. So the city attorney and I worked with their attorney and them to get those easements acquired and in place so that that work could then occur because of a pump house for the benefit of the Golf Club of Tennessee could not lie on DBI's property until the easement agreements were in place. So separate entities. One is a not-for-profit agricultural zone, the other is a commercial midway zone. So they have to have because of separate entities legally, and they're they're held separately. We had to have agreements between the two. So as that was approved uh, fairly recently by the Planning Commission, excuse me, in the meeting before last, we can now move forward with some of the other permitting. It needs to take place with the bridge structure and the wreckage ponds and all of the other things. So they were only permitted to do a temporary pond for retention. They were permitted to do uh, the bridge and they are permitted to do the grade. That's as far as they've gotten in the process. It's a very large project. Question was asked or a comment was made about the amount of material or acreage. It's 243.8 acres. It went through probably 14 months of review by the planning commission to get everything in place. It involved a Clomar submission that revolutionized eight times to FEMA to deal with the flood areas to make sure we weren't staying inside our ordinance and they're not doing anything that would start the flood area. Um, but just the general plan set and the flood agreement took a period of 14 months to put in place. Permitting first began in September of 2021. It was a limited scope permit. We have other permit applications in house on the Golf Club of Tennessee side of that divide. Um, and we have other permits that will be issued um, in the Golf Club of BBI once things are in place. But can issue permits until we address the soil and water. Is there any significance? I don't know anything about this issue besides what I've seen on the GIS and what planning commission does, but is there any significance to that area? Being part of our Kings and Springs urban growth plan, that, that we have, we have any more. Yes, that question comes up a lot, and you would think that we would have control over that. But the distinction for our authority under the contract that was entered into between Cheatham County and Kings and Springs for urban growth boundary is only in the event that they seek a rezoning and then attempt to subdivide. They did not subdivide the property that part of its whole parcels. So we don't have any control in that area. Uh, our, our jurisdiction stops, and I'm not saying we're not responsible for doing what needs to be done, 
but our jurisdictional authority stops at the city limits in this particular project. I discussed with the building official today um, that he might want to engage in a conversation since he's going to be the inspector for both the city and the county anyway, whether or not the county wants to see those inspections and monitoring it to say. That's the only suggestion that I can make. Uh, we have no control over the ditches or the roads. What I've seen is they did the best they could in the circumstance at the time for the disposition of all that material. But when you dig a 22 foot trench with an existing ditch, and then you don't dig beyond that, when the water comes again, it simply flows from the high spot to the low spot, and it'll flood exactly the same area. It will go directly across the same spot in the road. Um, so, what we've done is created um, an environment where there's communication lines open now. The only communication lines that are not open are TDAC. I attempted to communicate with TDAC with regard to this subject four times last week. All the emails were denied. Now, whether that's a function of the files being too large with the pictures that I attempted to send forward to them for the incident for November the 29th, every single one of them said that they were denied. So I tried again, I communicated again without attaching the pictures, simply saying, I believe this warrants a visit to this particular area. It has not been visited before. I have not heard back. So they're a state agency. I can't, you know, I can't force them to do what they don't want to do. And then I was told today that they're on home and they're not responding to some field business. Any other questions that I can answer? But I would like to give a comfort level, as you know, since um, the chairman of the planning commission is here tonight. We have done due diligence on this project from day one. And there were, as I said, eight submissions to FEMA that were turned around with a no and had to keep going back and going back. The grading plans were vetted by everybody we could lay eyes to that were, that were ever approved. We or TDAC in the position of holding a public hearing, they were going to do, but we can require it, and we did. So we've done as much as we can. We've worked with this project for three years. As I said, the total parcel size up there is how many acres? The portion that's in the city, uh, Commissioner Harness, is over 700 acres. It's in the city. It's in the city. Uh, how the, much is in the county? The, the remaining balance of 900 and some odd acres is in the county. There are several parcels that lie below Mr. Summers' property and above Mr. Summers' property that are in the county that um, are not in the city. So where, I don't know how familiar you are with the road in the area, but where it traversed the road in this last incident, that's the limit of the city. And the materials that are deposited above the roadway from the blasting really need to be moved back. That was one of the things the Planning Commission directed in its last meeting, if you'll remember. Get that material scale back from the edge of the, the edge of the property, the boundary, because it's above the road. So if it rains, then take a rocket scientist that runs downhill, takes the stuff with it when it goes. Any other questions? I appreciate your attention to this matter. Um, in the future, if you have questions as a body, I'm always happy to be here. If you have questions, you can always come to the Planning Commission and ask the chairman to address us or ask for, for three plus one to be enough. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right, do we have any legal updates? I have a couple of things tonight. I actually prepared just a little synopsis for our new uh, commission member and refresher for the old. Um, Excuse me, but it's already serving uh, commissioners uh, with respect to just a, an overall view of our charter. We're we're a city manager commission charter here, which is a little bit different than some of the other uh, towns around here. Uh, our charter, which you all saw me looking at that earlier tonight, that that's our, basically our bylaws. It sets forth uh, what the authority is and how we're supposed to act. Um, commission best you all, y'all are vested with authority to do things, there's a whole big long list. So I'm not going to bore you by going through all of them, but do things like set taxes, uh, open roads, uh, set speed limits, uh, make budgets, determine whether or not to spend things, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, you cannot act as individuals in, with respect to conducting any of that. For example, you, know, you can't say, go mow this person's yard or don't enforce the speed limit over here or go buy a set of Christmas lights for the Christmas in the park. You know, that, that authority um, would have to be vested with the board itself saying, okay, John, go buy a set of Christmas lights. You know, we most recently had our Christmas uh, in the park event. So uh, that needs to be you know, made clear that you all act as a body in that respect. Um, you can bring concerns, uh, requests for information, items for the agenda, uh, ideas on conduct of uh, the city manager, uh, staff, et cetera. Uh, they can all be brought to the attention of your city manager. P2 is outlined here in the charter. He has authority vested in the charter. Uh, he manages all the personnel and department heads. Uh, he is charged with making sure that the ordinances that you all pass, making sure that they're uh, enforced. Uh, he, um, ironically, under y'all's charter, he can only sign contracts if you all vest him with authority to do so. Some other cities just let the city manager sign them, uh, but y'all specifically requires your approval before he can jump into a contract. So, like, for example, you've seen all these contracts coming back and forth with TDOT for the sidewalks and things like that. That's why it's coming to you all and we're getting authority for the mayor or John to execute because John just can't go execute them themselves. Um, so he serves at the pleasure of the city commission. Uh, that's set forth in your bylaw as well. Uh, so that's just kind of a very 20,000 foot uh, overview of how uh, things are run in a city manager commissioner uh, set up like what we have here in Kingston Springs. A couple of quick little points on ethics. Um, and this was, I think there was actually a question earlier that arose about how can things be loaded on. Um, for those of you who have been here before, those of you know, you've heard this probably in your planning commission uh, session as well. Uh, obviously, commissioners can't do anything that will have personal benefit or gain to them. Uh, you can't take knowledge that you get in your capacity here and use that to uh, better your opportunities. It's kind of like insider trading on stock trading. And think of it in kind of that concept. If you're in a situation where you already have a, a personal interest, uh, you're not disqualified from voting in the state of Tennessee. You just have to declare that you have that personal interest. Uh, and the state does not prohibit you all then from exercising uh, a vote in that. And we've seen that before with Commissioner Hargis on things that have come before with related to the golf course where you've declared, here's my situation, but the state does not deprive him of the ability to vote. Right. And plus the fact the golf club Tennessee is one entity, the DBI golf course has no members right. at this point. Uh, I'm right. not a member of it. It's optional to join it if I ever decide to, but uh, but you've well, always yeah. gone above and beyond and made sure that yeah, everybody sure. heard that. So um, and then another thing that, you know, I always want to make sure to hammer home every chance I get, open meetings, uh, sunshine laws. You know, we, we, we talk about that periodically in here. Uh, in the state of Tennessee, you all are prohibited from having discussions with each other outside of an open meeting uh, with respect to anything that can be voted on. Ironically, your state legislature did not see fit to apply that to themselves, but every other <laughs> governmental body in the state of Tennessee is applicable to. Um, so, you know, if you're in the grocery store and you're discussing whether or not purity milk or Mayfield milk is better, that's fine because that doesn't involve, any, you know, involve anything that is going to be voted on. But if you are um, engaged in a conversation and you realize that it is talking about something that is either currently on the agenda or can reasonably be foreseen to be on the agenda for a vote, you do not need to have those conversations. And if you realize after the fact, oh, if this is coming up for a vote, those conversations need to be fully disclosed and rehashed in front of everyone in the public. That's how you cure a violation of open meetings. But the best cure is not to get on them in the first place. Um, so that was just a very brief look, uh, just kind of setting the pace. I know that you will go through uh, training. I'm sure the newly elected official, uh, but just kind of wanted to throw it out here. Thank you very much. All right, and I apologize to the, the Russells. Uh, I, I know you've been patiently waiting back, and I promise it would be faster than this, and I'm sorry. But uh, our next item on the agenda is a motion to approve resolution 22-017, recognizing 
Ms. Loretta Lynn for outstanding cultural enrichment. Uh, of course, as you know, uh, uh, Ms. Lynn passed away two months ago, and um, and and of course, her family is part of our family as a community here, and and she meant a lot to a lot of folks here, as we of course did around the entire world. So we, as a board, thought it might be appropriate to vote on a resolution in her honor tonight. So. Um, I guess we, we would start with, do we have a motion to approve this resolution? With motion to approve. So second? Second. Two. One, two. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. All right. All right, the motion passes. And I'll, I'll start by reading, and I, I would invite the Russell family, if you could come up here, please, as well, because we have something. We would like to present you with a copy as well. So, um, the resolution by the Board of Commissioners of the Town of Kingston Springs, Tennessee, recognizing Loretta Lynn for outstanding cultural enrichment, whereas the Town of Kingston Springs is pleased to recognize individuals that devote themselves to performing their craft, thereby enriching the lives of their community, and whereas Ms. Loretta Lynn devoted her time, energies, and talents to become an icon of country music, having a positive impact on the artists that have come after her and imparting a lasting influence on music of all genres. And whereas Miss Loretta Lynn dedicated her years to telling her story and the story of so many others through song while being a true inspiration to her original body of work. And whereas the Board of Commissioners of the Town of Kingston Springs would like to honor Miss Loretta Lynn and her family on the legacy that deserves esteem and recognition and an integral part of the fabric of this community. Now, there, now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Commissioners of the Town of Kingston Springs, Tennessee, meeting in this regular session, this 15th day of December, 2022, does hereby honor Ms. Loretta Lynn for enriching the lives of so many. So once again, thank you for being part of our community. And, and uh, I know this is, she's received so many honors from so many other places, bigger than the little town of Kansas Springs, but, but uh, this is, we wanted you to do something. So go get a picture of the middle. Right? Yeah, why don't you uh, all come on down here? We'll have uh, one here. All of you guys. Now we'll do it. Okay. Come on in. You're, 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 you Thank you. 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 All right. All right. On to new business. Uh, item 6A is a motion to approve resolution 22 019, establishing a sewer rate. And uh, we've got the kind of comparable rates in here. And John, would you like to? Uh... Sure. Go ahead, Mayor. So uh, you'll remember that we're, the, the board was going to look at uh, potentially raising sewer rates. Um, somewhere several months into the fifth year after we uh, uh, we could kind of ascertain what the current rates were, we're going to meet our needs of expenses. In your packet, there's several pieces of information regarding rates and where we look like we might end up. Just in reference, um, these comparison of rates are just for, uh, well, sorry, just for, um, um, Art, uh, not art, art. Oh, oh, yeah. operation and maintenance. So it's not like um, we could save money by not buying a truck. It's this yeah. is strictly operating and maintenance. It's the revenue generated from operating and maintenance revenue and the expenditures operating 
and maintenance expenditure. So just basically what it takes to run and what it takes to fix uh, the, uh, the system as it is. Um, there are a couple of different uh, pieces of information in your packet. One is uh, just a comparison rate uh, uh, to the Kingston Springs rates to other utilities around uh, the region. Uh, we, of course, don't set our rates comparative to any other utilities. Uh, we set our rates just by strictly the needs of the utility itself, but those comparisons are there just to um, show you what how our rates look compared to others uh, in the area. Um, Next is a page with uh, year-end projections of revenue and expenditures. A uh, monthly average was determined for both from the uh, data that we currently have, which was July through November, I do believe. Um, we got a monthly average of funds coming in, funds going out. Um, we try to project as accurately as possible, but it's very difficult. We looked at the, the last two or three years of monthly expenditures and revenues when it came to operating and maintenance expenses. Um, there's a few anomalies here and there where the rates, uh, the, so the income was low, um, uh, mostly having to do with uh, secondary reader refunds or unpaid bill refunds. There are a couple of uh, months where the operating expenses were high, um, but we didn't really find any trends uh, on a month-to-month -month basis over the last couple of years. So the best way we could think to project what we were going to look like at the end of the year was to take the data that we had in front of us, which was an average of expenses and revenues for the last um, July, July to uh, November, uh, and then extrapolate that out to see what revenue and expenses were going to be like for the next several months to the end of this fiscal year. And that's that data is in front of you. Um, we look to be if this is again just averages not accounting for any highs and lows or any emergencies um if everything goes as planned we would come up in the black two thousand seven hundred and ten dollars and 78 cents with our current rates john one question on expenditures fifty four thousand and fifty thousand acre you know 20 plus higher than the other months is that where we fix a couple of stations or Yes, it was. Uh, yes, it was most likely repair to the system, fixed a couple of stations. Uh, we did have. Uh, um, I'm going to use the term blowout because that's the first thing that popped into my mind. But the Acorn Port pump station uh, had some issues that had to be repaired. Um, so yeah, these are just normal operating expenses, but those spikes come from um, emergency situations like that. So including those in the six month average probably means the expenditure average is a little higher. The others are running in the thirties, mid thirties, not in the fifties. Correct. 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 So um, it's hard to predict the future. You don't know if it's going to well, happen. You don't know. If I get that. Uh, I understand that. But it's a little hard to say whether well, you've got an average expenditure in two and a third of the months or when it ran high. Um, if we're not going to have a pump station blow out every every month. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not going to Yes, I see your point. But yeah. uh, we included that information and we included both the highs and the lows. Um, because did you have any other months in the whole year where you had 50 grand expenditures? For the last uh, couple of prior, years? The prior fiscal year. Well, in January through June, you're showing yeah. July through the November. Yeah, I believe yeah. this is this fiscal year. So I think what was going to be prior fiscal year. Prior uh, fiscal yeah. year in April of uh, 22, we had a $61,000 month. I didn't uh, finish totaling May and June for you, but I know that those were high months as well because of um, the septic pumping that we had in that last quarter. Um, I'm pretty sure that it was somewhere around 60000 but I, I didn't get finished totaling that out. That's the month you guys from the budget. You said that April, May, and June, 60,000 was mm -hmm. So that's the fourth quarter last year were our high months. Um, but they mostly last last fiscal year stayed in the $30,000 range. Um, in October, we had a $44,000 month. In January, we had a $45,000 month. And then in April, it spiked up to 61. I will mention too, that I didn't record December's revenue on this sheet that we gave you because I didn't have it at the time, but we only brought in $22,000 in revenue in December. So that's also going to make your revenue average go down significantly. 
or you have to read it for that is because you did a write off for the secondary meters and it makes your, your overall check come back in less because they write off other mail. Right. And then we do that again in May. So in May, we'll also have a um, write off in uh, April for the write offs, I think is when it is. And then in May, that check comes in a little bit less as well, around $20,000 when I'm gathering for the last several years. So we try to prognosticate as accurately as possible, but again, you can't predict the future. So we were just working with the data that we had. Um, there's also, go ahead. So really what I want to say is kind of getting some of what Mike was saying is, uh, you know, we hope we're not having these high months, obviously, everybody hopes for those, but I, I wonder too, and I have historical data on this, are we seeing more of these types of issues with the aging the aging infrastructure essentially i mean it seems like it seems like they've become a little more prevalent as we continue with that you know we are seeing more of these issues and, and to that point tony i'd also like to to point out that moving forward at least for the last several months we previously had a wastewater operator that was full-time that could take care of issues uh, a lot of the work that um, uh, would normally have been farmed out, hired out to elite, uh, was done in-house. We don't have that person anymore. And we've got somebody that's working part-time that's doing the testing and doing some triage for reports and calls of, of, of problems and issues. But there's only so far that that can go, and then we're going to have to call elite. So who, who's our contract and uh, service uh, provider? Those calls are going to be more frequent, just for a couple of reasons. One, because of the aging infrastructure, and two, because we don't have staff now to take care of issues that we previously had staff with. Well, how much did the second six months when the 10% rate increase went in change from the first six months? In other words, how much revenue did it, did it drive? Um, I, I think it was somewhere around $3,000. I'd have to really dive into that more. But I think that's only about the increase that we had between like- It was effective July 1, right? Mm -hmm. 10% rate increase. Mm -hmm. $3,000 a month. Huh? I think it's an additional around $3,000 a month. Okay. I, I okay. could be wrong on that. But I need to dive into that a little bit more. Not me. No. So also included in, in the information that you have is uh, a percentage of increase, um, looking at the average of revenue and the average of expenditures that were extrapolated, then the percentage of increase um, would show for the next six months, January through June, what additional revenue a certain percentage would generate from 5% up to, I think, 25%. Um, and then the very last page is kind of that same situation going on what a five to 25 percent um, increase would look like on bills and then at the very bottom there's a table that shows just sort of a random section of a, a, a low medium and a high monthly bill and then put the different percentage of uh, as far as usage goes and what a different percentage would how that would change those bills so the task for the board this evening is to determine if a rate increase uh, is warranted, and if so, what amount of increase that needs to be. Um, if the board would like some additional information before making this decision, we'd be happy to provide that, but uh, I'd like some direction on what information you'd like us to gather before we make the decision. My only question is with all the other discussion around sewer and the changes to the system, and the needs and the expenses is this time really to make it, or is it going to be a bigger increase later on down the road with all these repairs that we're talking about? So, this interestingly enough, I, I think to some degree, a lot of the major repairs wouldn't be addressed by a rate increase. This is just basically, That's this is kind of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is basically just this is maintenance and operational costs. This is, so, so when we talk about like those very, very large problems, that's that's its own thing that's going to be. Yeah, this, this is basically just, you know, 
keeping the trains running on time. Oh, it's perfect. But this is where we need to show a profit. We were had a deficit Correct. this year of seventy three thousand. Last year we had a profit or not profit net position of forty five hundred. The year before in twenty twenty we had a twenty six thousand net position. So last year, since we have a deficit, we have to pretty much increase it to to be uh, a surplus next year in 2023. We're going to do up and saving. Yeah. And it's just a, a kind of food for thought as well that our rate structure, as you, as you see on that uh, that first page where it's um, got the comparison with other municipalities uh, uh, yes. or other uh, service, services around the counties. Um, our rate structure is different than everybody else's. Um, I, I think that uh, this might be best served as a retreat topic, but um, that would suggest that we change the way our rate structure is. Um, so rather than having a low monthly cost with additional higher cost for uh, usage, usage um, which is very hard to gauge because it all depends on usage. You don't know what's going to come in every month until you find out how many people flush your toilet that month because it all comes through water usage. Um, to have a more established base rate um, and less emphasis on the actual usage. But again, uh, just something that staff has talked about to make our cross prognostication a little more accurate in the future. I mean, I think that the um, kind of getting to Carolyn's point too is, 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 you know, right now, I think the major concern is making sure that we see mm -hmm. a profit this year on the sewer system and, and, and the rate structure might be a, a might, the rate structure itself, I think would probably be a retreat topic. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, itself changing that physically, actually physically changing the uh, rate structure. Um, so I guess from my, my question is from the perspective of, you know, because we don't have Demetri, we don't really have a sewer plant manager of any kind at this time, but from the perception of, of uh, running the sewer system, what's it going to take to get us in that position at the end of the year? I mean, by July, where are we going to be? Uh, I mean, I guess nobody knows that. Right. And, it's and that's part of, the, that part of the, the, the instability of the rate structure. It is, it's and, it's, and, it's, and it also, it's, we don't have the luxury of saying, okay, let's pinch some pennies, let's not buy the truck this year, let's not do this, or let's not do that this year, and push that off to next year, because those it's expenses aren't included, well, those expenses aren't included in operating and maintenance. This is strictly, it's not that, uh, you know, we've got uh, X amount of dollars budgeted for uh, this different, these different pieces of equipment or this training or this kind of stuff that we can scale back and say, we're not going to do that this year. So that then improves our bottom line. It does. But as far as the, uh, the comptroller's office is concerned, it's strictly uh, the, the items that fall under their categories of operating and paying. So, um, uh, same thing on the revenue side with grant monies coming in we those are discounted you can't talk about anything as far as operating and maintenance today kind of grant money this is purely the money that comes in from the users of this system that's the operating and maintenance revenue and then the money that goes out that is that falls under the category of operating and maintenance which is basically fixing stuff when it's broke and you run right yes yeah. we Tend to fix things when it's. Yeah, like we've fun. already done a ten percent increase, and I, mean, I guess uh, that was kind of a crapshoot, pun intended, on mm -hmm. on, uh, on on trying to see where we were going to, what our position was going to be, and now we're basically at a point where we need to make some sort of increase just to make sure that we do still yes. hit that. So, and I guess the not, I mean, but you're you reflecting six months of the increase. You, you haven't earned. Oh, 10%, yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had half a year with no increase. You had a second half of the year with a 10. So, no, so we, uh, yeah, I think that now this goes just straight fiscal year. Fiscal so, year. it starts July 1st July. with that 10%. That's what I'm saying. The increase went in July 1. But you've only seen the impact on revenue from July 1 till the day. You had no increase at all from, from maybe you did, but there wasn't. A, a 10% increase on a January one to show you the full year run rate. 
Right, but the run rate goes from July 1st to June 30th. I get that, but uh, you're missing my point here. What you're showing on here is just six months of the increase. You're going to have another six months. Yes, second half of the year. I yeah, gotcha. right. Okay. So whatever that, that realized amount is. I mean, so, of course, you all can't vote, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is Kate Blaine Baker, this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mark, you if I'm not mistaken, this could be tabled. Yes, you all can table it until you come back from recess. Um, if we're going to recess this meeting, maybe we should table this event. Do we have a motion? Do, is that something you want to like do? Or, or we'll go. We'll, we'll get to continue. No, it's just yeah. Yeah. I think the people that were here when we were discussing the super plan, I think that everybody knows that rates are going to have to go up sometime. They just didn't want them to go up 200% under new ownership. So no. I think everyone is, is, is expecting this. I think they kind of got that, that in order to correct everything, in order to no. you know get the surplus. I think I think people are going to be out, you know, out, outraged as much. I think they, they everybody's kind of knowing this is coming. I agree. I mean, it's slowly keep turning it up rather than have a, a large adjustment we just know it's going to have to increase yeah especially if we don't show a slight problem this year we're right. at the mercy of the state and they they could they, they could set their they could measure the base that's right yeah so if we do a small increase then at least another good thing about that is if this if we somehow don't show a problem even with an increase at least we're showing the state that they were making an effort to do well, i think it's in it two out of three years or something like that yeah, i mean two in a row Two in, row. two in a row. So last year, did we lose money last year? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So we yeah. last year was our first year, so that was our first strike. It's a okay. two strike ball game you now. I would ask that if the if the board chooses to table this, if there are any questions or additional information that that the commissioner would like. Now, what I would say, well, I, I, go ahead. Actually, answer that question. Go ahead. Is there anything the commissioners would like in additional information? This, this is what we're here. Right? This is, yeah. If, if we would, I mean, because if we, well, I mean, I, I, I suppose if we were, we're going to resume this meeting in the very near future, because we have to swear in everybody, so we could do that. Uh, I, I think that since we can have open discussion, though, with the other commissioners, there's the ability to go ahead and set the rate today. And I think that, you know, you I guys agree. could you guys can jump up and down and there was a flip. You see, we're doing is blink twice. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so, um, so then I would ask, I mean, well, I mean, so we basically have some options there. We can set a rate, uh, we can set a rate increase, or we can table this to a, a later date. So do we have any do, do I have any motions from the commissioners of Canvo? I believe we should just decide. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What, what what do you think we should decide? I think we should go up to ten percent right now. An additional ten percent. What is what does this side of the room think of set proposals? The non-voting side of the room. <laughs> to Mike's point, we went up ten percent last year, and we haven't seen that full result yet. Do we need to go up another ten percent, or can we go up five percent and gain the result that we need to carry on the sewer? Or what 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 is this? You guys, I think the city manager and staff can probably help us a little bit better with what number is recommended to be yeah. honest with you they don't really have my that. number would be as high as you can the highest that is the truth it, it, it has to it will eventually get up there it's gradual hits is better than a massive massive one. looking at us versus the surrounding areas which i know we don't base our rates off we're a lot lower we don't and Mike, as the only other member of this board besides me that actually pays the sewer red, what are your thoughts? Well, um, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's kind of tough to compare the other rates. So they got a high base rate, but then, you know, they got a pretty high um, water usage before they get, and, the, and it's lower in those second tiers. I don't yeah. know how that figures out. I mean, I, it's kind of hard to calculate. Um, you know, our base fee is pretty low, so maybe you could bump the base fee, but that seems like that would be something that, um, if you're going to change the fee structure, that we ought to be doing in a retreat. I, I think, I think so. So, I, I think here maybe the question is just whether or not we want to go ahead and make a rate increase now, and then we'll look at that rate structure 
for you know, and then and, and of course, yeah, when we look at that retreat, then that will go into the budget meeting. But the budget meeting, we can really look at that, and then we could implement a new structure starting you know the next fiscal year. Well, if you look at your run rate, you're about at break even now, and that's close. And any surprises will throw you off track, you know. But to add in another twenty three thousand over six months with another ten percent increase on top seems to be excessive to me. Um, we just took a pretty big hit, so one man's opinion. But uh, but we also are now our, our we're the gun. We're with, we're with elite, okay. We're using utilizing them, so any issues that we do have, it's going to be far more expensive than we did last year. Right. So, if you take the impact of 10 percent, if these figures are right twice, uh, you're up 20 percent for all the next year. So, you're talking according to your figures, 46,000 more dollars. You can always decrease it. Thank well, you. I'm just saying, you know, you got to kind of hit the sweet spot here, you can't overcharge either. Uh, on your run rate, or, or you're going to have the same problem. So I'm just suggesting that maybe we'd be to moderate the second phase of that a little. And how much of a little? I don't know, but um, it looks like you caught up to about even with six months of revenue. So next year, you're going to have 12 months of 10 plus whatever else. So 12 of 10 is 46,000 more according to your number here. Yes, I understand that, but I'm not sure that I'm following your math. The, well, John, the math is you your your run rate right now, according to your projections, even with two pretty high months in there, is about break even. Yes. With six months of revenue. Yes. You put that same revenue and you continue with yearly average expenses, because this is run rate, this isn't infrastructure repair, then you, you know you're gonna be it's more than adequate at 10% for a 12 month run rate. Then if you throw another 23,000 on top of that. Which is what this is more than 23. Another 10 for that's for six months. For 12 months is 46. You know, if, if we extrapolate the current six months, another 12 months, we're going to be in the black 2,700 and something dollars. Okay. Right. But when you look down here on your increase, you're showing a six month increase of 10% more on top of what we've done. That's 23,000 in six months. Yeah. So at the end of the fiscal year, we would be at 23,000, whatever change that is, plus $2,700. Right. About 25,000. Yes. But then you're at 20% right through the next fiscal year for the whole year, John. Yes. So, um, yes. Right. I understand. You with me here? I am. So you're talking about 23 or 22, right. I'm sorry, 23. You're, you're, looking at, you're looking at it in a fiscal year, but these are annual ongoing races. We don't go back to zero in July 1. You're going to put 10 on now, and you have. That's got back got you break even in the last six months. Right. All right. Next six months, you're gonna, if we put another 10 on, now you're at 20. And then yes. after that six months, you're at 20 forever. Yes. Unless you come back and reduce the rate. So yes. my point is that you're going to be well in the black at, with two 10% rate increase. You could always come back next year and either not raise the rates or reduce the rates. I'm going to say the one word, elite. Okay. That is what we're dealing with. That is the higher expense issue right. over last year. You want to pay you're not giving it to you. Thank you. I'm right. almost going to have to stay at 20 for next year just because of the and, and we're looking at yeah, that. Of course, I think also to, to look, we might be looking at totally different numbers if we look into restructuring the rate structure mm -hmm. going into the next budget. Right. As well. the whole game, right? Yeah, everything. I mean, basically, we're, this this map is out the window at that point because we're looking at having a higher base rate and so on, and then you know that that'll affect probably lower rates down the line possibly or leading to the same or, or, or so on. So we're really just looking at something completely different at that point, I think. But um, I, what's, the, what's the will of the board? Do we have a motion? I know, I know we've uh, got that and we could. Well, I, know, I was thinking actually about 13%, but I know that there, but I don't think any of us is going to be in agreement with that. But I don't know, they're you know, taking the middle of, of what they divided 20%, 25, take the one that puts in the middle. Motion raise the sewer rate 10%. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes.
That was it. <laughs> You're right. Uh, 844. Right. Item B. Motion to approve rescue boat and trailer donation to Kingston Springs Volunteer Fire Department. I imagine that's what I've been driving by every morning. And it's it's a uh, actual rescue boat. It's made in the it's a connector series, which Edwin Hogan I, I, DMA has one. And so they're designed to be hooked together if you have a situation where you're looking for a body, whatever that that's like. But it came, uh, the donation was the boat, trailer, uh, 30 horsepower, Evan Rig motor. Um, Who was the donation from? Um, a neighboring community. Okay. I guess, I don't know how much publicity they want. That was that. Okay. Motion to approve. Where's it going to be stored? Um, we are looking at, we budgeted to put a metal building down by the sewer plant, so we're hoping to get that built soon, and that's where the box will be started. Can I go through the other So currently, the storage plant is under the... Well, right now, oh, we're right inside the bay of the fire. Oh, yeah. So, um, we're trying to keep... Everything inside that we can. Yeah. But that boat will probably be. We've got to take and, and test the motor, see how that's going to work, get it re lettered, some things like that. So it's going to be a you know, couple of month process just getting it to where hopefully when the spring floods come, we're ready. And we also have those two. Uh, rescue rounds yeah. that have the motors so we will be much more prepared than we've ever been for if we ever see another 2010 but anytime the Harford river gets above six feet the current is unbelievable i mean you wouldn't yeah. leave that little river but at six feet you've got a lot of current. so um, at any time it's at that level, you're going to have to use one of these plans. The motion to hit the rocks at all? Right? Not at six feet. Now, we can't run any of the boats with the motors, which is why we have the kayaks. Uh, when you get below, really, we try not to put them in below four feet, um, preferably five. Uh, we typically we, we have mapped out and have a lot of access points that we know where we can get the, the kayaks in the water to try to get to the people and it's it's usually pretty good with dispatch of being able to ping their phone that it's called from and get the closest address from their GPS location so um, you know it's just the nature of the river that most of the time in the summertime, you're you're faced with dealing with with kayaks. So I do know that state parks is getting a kayak that is as a motor. And I'm anxious to see when they get it how that does. Um, it's a small motor, but um, it would be much more usable in more shallow water. All right. Well, we have a. Do we have, we have? I believe we have a motion. Second. We have a second. All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Item C is motion to approve, approve recommendation from the Kingston Springs Board of Zoning Appeals to waive the permit fee fine fee fine for basement finished without permit by previous owner at two sixty nine Harvard View Trail. Um, go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Board of Zoning Appeals had a uh, meeting a couple of months ago, and within that meeting, we have an applicant here who applied for a permit. It was discovered that when they applied for the permit, the basement was finished in the living space without a permit. By the previous owner, they had just purchased the property. We have that situation come up fairly routinely in the city now. So in their effort to do the right thing and secure a permit to finish another portion of the basement, 
and discover that the previously finished porcelain basement was not really permitted when it was done. So in this particular case, as we've done in every other time this has come up, we asked the Board of Zoning Appeals to recommend to the City Commission that you waive the fine, which doubles the permit fee. We can't waive the permit fee, it's statutorily required as it's permit, but the fine you can waive because it was not caused by the actions of the same. Okay. It's sold to them that way. Yeah, you can find them for something they didn't do. They're trying to do it right. They're... Exactly. Absolutely. I can't be exactly. fine. And we had the same discussion for another property on Kingston Springs Railway right Planning Commission several months ago right. when it was discovered that was happening there about waiving the fee. That's the requirement. It's the way of fine, not the fee. Motion to approve the way of the fine. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion passes. Item D is a motion to approve first reading ordinance 22-012 amending Title V, Chapter 4 of the Kingston Springs Municipal Code, the municipal purchasing requirement. So the, the short story is the state of Tennessee broke the I'll turn it over to you in just a second, but uh, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. The state of Tennessee changed their purchasing requirements, right? The biggest impact for us would be that uh, right now that uh, the town of Kingston Springs, anything purchased over $10,000 requires to see a bid. They changed that to $25,000. So the town of Kingston Springs wanted to go along with the new state requirements. Um, however, after further review, um, it seems that the $10,000 limit is hardwired into the town's um, uh, charter. charter. Thank you very much. I word escaped me. So, um, the, this was really now just a discussion topic because <laughs> it turns out that the charter would need to be changed when it's required legislative activity and it's all. So, because the problem with operating on a charter from 50 years ago. And, and you could, if you chose, yeah. ask for, I mean, I, in bear in mind, I don't advocate changing a charter just at you know the flip of a switch but if it's something you all want to consider to request and have the charter changed to where it's tied to whatever state law limits are so that you know as we will see with the cost of expenses going up you know it will be easy to proceed 20 years down the road we'll probably be looking at twenty five thousand dollars and thinking Oh my word, what we have to spend to get bids, you know, do a bidding process for spending 25000 So, you know, might be something y'all want to think about, maybe even have it in your uh, retreat for profession. Free. But but do keep in mind, if you want it done this year, you do have a legislative session coming up, uh, and you need to work with your representatives in, in order to get that done. Okay. So, so, no action. All right, no action. action. Right. I contacted my state representative tonight, but she wasn't close enough to clear anybody out of the court So, um, okay. so a motion to approve uh, payment uh, for a permanent and temporary easement agreement on the Ivy property 189 Maple Court, $18,000 for construction of the new wastewater pump station. Uh, funding allocated to the current budget, and this is, of course, the pump station we're replacing. And uh, it is, it, yeah, so yeah, this relates to yeah, that. New, it, well, he lives on the easement that got the lock on me. Oh, yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. So, we call it the acorn port pump station because uh, currently that's the way that it's accessed, but this would be uh, the address is actually Maple, Maple Port or that the, the pump station lies on. Um, this uh, is uh, uh the primary easement that is uh, being obtained here is a permanent easement. There's temporary construction easement, but the primary easement is constru uh, permanent easement, which is basically land acquisition. So that's why we brought it to the board. Um, this dollar figure is uh, already in the current project budget. But again, because it is land acquisition, we wanted to bring it to the board to get uh, approved. What's the timeline of that? What it's, it gets approved? This is the last step. Uh, we've been. Um, uh, Waiting actually, it's it's coincided uh, quite well. Just within the last few weeks, uh, TDEC has approved the final construction plans for that pump station. So once we get this done, um, we can take it over, have it registered uh, at the county, and um, put out construction bids. It should be a fairly short window for the construction bids. Uh, I'm just gonna don't hold into this. I'm just going to throw out numbers or dates. But uh, if we could get uh, sometime the first couple of weeks of January, we send it out for about a month. 
Uh, bids come back in, let's say the end of February, um, estimating probably a three to four month project. So by the summer, we'll be up and running. So the 18 is for us to buy the right of way of the property of Sutter and all the property. Find an easement. Yes, there's a, not only is a, this a additional property for the pump station itself to be set on, but to build a permanent road from uh, across the side of that property to get back to that pump station. Yeah. Motion to approve. Second. All there. Aye. All right. Actually, I'm sorry, you all need to do voice. Oh, we do. My, I apologize on that. Yeah, so, uh, Don, could you please call? We have a motion and a second. Don, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Clark? Yes. Tony Gross? Yes. Glenn Krivik. Thank you. <laughs> yes. We didn't do roll call on the zero rate. Increase. That's that mm -hmm. is a very good point. Yeah. We should also call more. Yeah. 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 One of you guys make a motion to yeah, my bad. Roll call on the sewer rate increase. Motion to revote by roll call on the uh, sewer rate increase. Second. We have a second. Second. So, Carol Clark. Yes. Ronnie Gross. Yes. Glenn Murray. Yes. All right. Motion passes. All right. Uh, now we're on to item F is a motion to approve change order request number two for T.10 and 123630 uh, for SR, our SR249 multi modal project. So. so, this change order for the multi modal projects uh, for $22,176.76 and relate to primary limit changes in stormwater drainage um, that's been um, uh, modified somewhat uh, with the project. The items uh, are either one um, item supplementing items that are not going to be used that are on the current uh, construction plans like rip rock. Uh, that item is um, not in the current construction plans, but it's going to be replacing some curb and gutter items that are in the current construction plans. Uh, the other items on that list that's in your packet are items that uh, are current existing infrastructure but for, uh, once they got in and started digging things out, it uh, determined that uh, they're in such poor condition that those needed to be replaced. And uh, there are some grates and some uh, uh, stormwater inlets and that kind of thing. Um, the $22,000 doesn't necessarily correlate to the project going over $22,000. The, the the ups and downs, the ins and outs of the line items will be uh, determined once the project is finished. But these are just items that were not in the original uh, construction plans and the original list of uh, products to be used for the, for the project. So they need to be. But do we have any idea what this actually does to the bottom line for the project? I mean, that's don't. that's the yeah. issue. I think that everybody. Yeah. Would be concerned about well best case scenario would be we pay 20 percent of that right if it's if no. it was if, if we were exactly on budget and that was the overage we owe 20 percent no sir we went over the we were we would all the entire overage yes but, uh, did, yeah, okay. oh. Okay. or do you mean 20 okay I'm not following that exactly. Right. So the 80, so the, the project, it's actually this project is, I believe it was a 95 five split. But the short story is PDOT's given us all the money that PDOT's going to give us for this total project. So anything above, any overruns on this project would be at a uh, 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 sort of at a local level. Do we know, we have any idea if there are going to be any overruns? No, sir, I don't. And it's because that there are some parts of the project where they've not used all the quantities that were available to them. Uh, there are some parts of the project like this um, where they're uh, having to use items that were not in that original list of product. So, um, you know, it's uh, with the best of luck, it's going to even out, but I really don't have any. Uh, we already had to tear out a couple sections that weren't compliant. We were here, right? Yes, and that information or that expense is going to be absorbed by the contractor. There is also uh, uh, the railing in front of El Jardin, the uh, Mexican restaurant. Uh, on the plan set, that railing was one of those little things or are, are commonly called islands in this project. That railing was one island up. Uh, the railing had to be moved. There was a miscommunication where the uh, slope of that railing was not altered. So it was sloped for the original island instead of the 
secondary island that it was initially or that, that it ended up being placed in. So that really had to be rebuilt. Um, they initially pushed that back on the town to pay for that, and we pushed that back on them saying, well, we're not responsibility. So that's there was a delay in getting this change order to you. It's that was that that battle to have that removed. So that was removed from that change order, and that was about fifteen thousand dollars right there. So um there are going to be some overages, but there's going to be some underages. So it's just a matter of finding out at the end of the project what it's going to come out at. I can speak with the contractor and the engineer and try to get you an estimate where we stand right now. They're probably at 90%. So it's going to be close. I mean, I'd certainly like to have, have a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like. Well, I mean, well, yeah. You know, <laughs> Yeah, most contractors work. He, he ate a lot of money rebuilt, re tearing up the sidewalks and reforming them to the 88 clients. Right. So, um, that's why I'm kind of curious um, how much of this is, is is he trying to bake in as you know, to his mistake? Yeah, that's now yeah, and to, to clarify too that these um, these quantities and these items they are approved by PDOF before they're. Approved by, well, I mean, it's a, it's a joint project, but it's not just us that approved it. PDOT has to uh, approve the amounts and the reasoning and all that kind of stuff, too. So there is oversight from the state. Well, they, they don't remain any over, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they have to be clear on this. <laughs> they tell us what to do. We have the table. That's the thing. Yeah. 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 We have a motion and a second. Tom, could you please call the roll? Carol Clark? Yes. Tom Gross? Yes. Glenn Runner? Yes. All right, the motion passes. All right, um, a discussion of code issue, the old school building, property on North Main Street and uh, 417 Mount Pleasant Road. Um, we have our codes enforcement officer here. Thank you. Uh, I received a Complaint letter forwarded to me regarding a couple of properties in the in the city, and I wanted to bring it to the board of commissioners because the city manager and I have discussed it, and uh, there's a couple of issues that I saw with the letter that I wanted to bring to the board's attention. Uh, for your information, one of the, the second of the properties listed was on Mount Pleasant Road. And that property, I have spoken with the family that owns it this week. Uh, the, the property was tied up by the state of Tennessee. The state of Tennessee had that property. And it was tied up in court and litigation and ongoings, whatever they were, for, as long as I for the passing of a pre the previous owner. And that my understanding from talking with the property owner that issue has been resolved in very very recent past last last few days or weeks and that property owner's intent is to brush all that property off immediately get it cleaned up as quickly as he can so he can get to the house and go through the house uh from his dead relatives belongings and and then his intent i think is is to potentially tear that house to the ground. So I think that issue is resolved. Uh, the second issue involves a building that was once a school is now owned by a private residence here in the city. Um, and my concern is because uh, the property, uh, the letter indicates that, that we haven't had any, I have been to that property once before, on a previous complaint that I got from the city manager last year, the complaint was that there was a tree going through the roof. And I thought, well, that would be fun to go look at. So I went and looked at that. And it turned out, if you drive up to the to it from the front, I thought, there's a tree right there. And you go around to the back and you look and, yep, yeah, there's a tree. And it looks like it's coming right out of that road. But it's not. It was a Formosa tree that was in the courtyard of that old school and had gotten so tall that it was no longer being maintained, so it had gotten so tall. And it certainly appeared it to come through the roof. There were some things growing up on the roof uh, and some issues with the property, and those were somewhat addressed. Now, uh, part of it was the lot board, and 
while I went up there conduct that inspection that day, there was a crew showed up to mow all of the property uh, that was with the school. So I did not feel any need to go any further with that and reported back to the city manager. But this letter indicates that nothing has ever been done, and that is not the case. That is also the, the case, I would say, with, with the, the statement at the bottom of the letter about Hemel property. And the Hemmer properties, I know the, of two or three of them right here that I can speak to personally that I know have been resolved. Uh, this this house right behind us here uh, is now cleaned up. It wasn't a few months ago there were tenants in it and they had a lot of trash and accumulation of debris from when they were moving out. The owners have cleaned that up. That's one property that was cleaned up. The second property that was a Hemmer property was the old depot location over here, and the city now owns it, so it got cleaned up very quickly, but that's a second prop Hemmer property that was cleaned up. And I know when Mr. Hemmer was really ill towards the end of his life, uh, I spoke with the city manager, and we worked on the property here through his son, who was going to inherit these properties uh, with the station, and that was cleaned up in the trash, which removed from behind it and they cut the grass and stuff for it. I know last summer and that case was open and closed and, and it went away. So those those had been taken care of. But it would also it's just uh, concerning that all of these things could have easily been answered and they're not. They're reported as facts and this not necessarily the case. So the other thing I would caution the, the commissioners to look at is you have with you some attachments to that. And if you look at the first page of the first attachment to that, if you look at chapter 13, 202 of that, subsection three, uh, it might enlighten you as to whether or not you should take much credence in that that attachment. So, and the long and short, we strictly have been working off of complaints that we received. We don't go property to property here in Kingston Springs and stop and knock on people's door. I inherited quite a laundry list of properties that were already so case files, if you will, uh, when I take, took the position. And we've been steadily working on those uh, to the point that we have several of them in court now, have had for months. And we're not having a great deal of luck there, but we're continuing to, to move ahead and try to resolve those. And I just want you to have confidence that we are working these issues. In fact, some of them that have been relayed here have been worked and are ongoing right now. Now, back to the school. Uh, the property has deteriorated since I was there. I did a windshield inspection of it this week, and my intent, and I had to do some research because some of the language here with, with regard to slums and all of that, some of it, sometimes when you do some of these actions, it involves this board to, you would have to designate an area, a slum area or something. So, I think these can be handled through the property maintenance code and building maintenance codes. And I have spoken with the Cheatham County building inspector today after his inspection up there. And he's perfectly amenable to inspecting it for me because we have to make a determination based on the value of the uh, structure and what it would take to repair the structure. And that dictates what our Category. action would be. If it can reasonably be fixed, then you can require a person, an owner to fix it. If it can't, you would require them to demolish it. So that could potentially be a very contentious issue. And I just wanted you to be aware of what we're fixing to step into. But we are working with tax. Thank you. Very good. So now, I mean, and, and, and when you spoke well, with, uh, when you with Franklin about this, he's are we, are we going to go ahead? Is he going to come out and inspect the building? I've got to, or do we need try to, to contact the property owner and make sure. And I wanted to 
hold that off, not contact him until after I talk to y'all tonight. And so I will be contacting him next week or trying to. I think I have his email here within the city. So uh, we're going to try to email him and schedule the inspection with him. And uh, the building inspector has to do that type of inspection. And if I may, Mayor, briefly, a couple of things. Um, the inside of the building is inaccessible because it's padlocked and locked to us. So we'll have to contact property owner in order to gain access to the inside of the building. And a second observation, the way code enforcement works is the city manager who supervises code official sends him complaints. They come through his, his office to us and we work on the demands that we send from that referral. Uh, if citizens call, they call the city. That's the number they call. See them in person before we go and handle it from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You're doing good work. I appreciate it. One thing I want to add on this, as far as schools concerned, is that, you know, it, you know, like I said, I've been here 20 years. It's been like that. Yeah. And uh, people do notice when I was at the farmer's market, we had an official come here. He was a uh, North Carolina uh, commissioner. And he was really complimentary of our town and we love everything about it. First thing he said was, What's up with that at Council Hill? And so people do notice that. That and the old hotel. Yeah. <laughs> So, All right, so we kind of flip back to my page. It's oh, I got two copies of the thing here. I got the one that's over the right page. All right, and then the light on side I'm coming to is from the uh, Planning Commission's discussion of King Springs Regional Planning Commission recommendations to advise the Board of Commissioners to review and establish process of communication between commissioners and staff and to seek the hiring of a full time building inspector. So it's two different things. It's sort of two different things. It's two uh, recommendations from the Planning Commission. Um, so, so the if we can handle the second part first, the currently um, just a, some brief history. Um, the town has for the last probably 10, 12 years, if not longer, used um, uh, for a while, we worked with building inspectors that fell under the umbrella of the uh, Pleasant View Fire Department and uh, Chief Duncan uh, and his uh, licensure as, as a building inspector. Um, and recently, uh, just a couple of years ago, um, when Chief Duncan was unable to provide that service anymore, we farmed out and hired um, a service of a building inspector. Um, that was part time, their kind of niche market of working in several small towns uh, similar to us that didn't need a full time building inspector. Um, that didn't quite work out as well. So we uh, ended up uh, and have been using for the past couple of years um, the relationship with Cheatham County and Franklin Wilkinson and his department uh, with Cheatham County Building uh, and Coast Department. Uh, Franklin and his inspectors have been very. Um, uh, Friendly to us and uh, generous for uh, to provide those services to us. However, um, uh, as building continues to increase uh, in Kingston Springs, uh, it does seem that a building inspector would be a good direction for the town to approach. Um, again, however, um, it's a difficult task. Uh, just as an example, Pleasant View has been looking for a building inspector for the last eight months and Pleasant View is a boom town compared to Kingston Springs. Um, I think mean, the last time I spoke with Pleasant View, which was two weeks ago, they were looking at uh, their best applicant was uh, someone from the trades, uh, an electrician or a plumber that they were going to um, potentially hire that then send them through the certification and the training to be a building inspector for them. Um, We'll definitely look for if the board would like to uh, uh, for us to go down this path. We'll definitely start looking for a building inspector. But I just wanted to set expectations as uh, it's not going to be a quick process. Um, uh, we'll definitely do our due diligence to see what we can find out. But um, it's not only that building inspectors uh, are few and far between as far as taking on work, but um, part time building inspectors are even more difficult to find. I and mean, really, I, I would say in some ways, these are kind of part and parcel, some of the same discussion, because right now we've got just a very convoluted system going on. I mean, I think we can't 
costs. I mean, we could have a building inspector and then somebody that's approving permits, and those are not the same people. Um, which ideally, I think they would be. If I'm, mm -hmm. I mean, ideally, that would be the same person. Right. So we are using the county, which is a great value to the taxpayer. I will say that because the you can't beat the price. But um, for building inspecting, but but it, it, it's the building inspector is not on. Not, does, you know, they're, they're operating separately of each other, and so the, the permits get issued, and then the building inspector. Uh, inspects and, and it's just it, it, it's making the whole kind of mess. I, I understand as a small town we're kind of in a position where we have to do such things because because of the difficulty you have. We've always, I mean, the time I've been here, always had a difficulty with this very issue sorting out basically these very things. And of course, as you said, a part-time building inspector is pretty close to impossible to come by. What this PR is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They use Jim County as well. They're basically the old work. Ideally, you would have the permit fees come with the cost of the building. This year, right? mm -hmm. so ideally, and, 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 we just don't. and the permit fees are generate. We're generating higher permit fees, from my understanding, right now, and possibly enough. I don't know if it's enough to. I don't know. But Martha Brooke had something to throw in. Sure. So, one thing also that, that may be a problem in this situation, especially in light of being aware that there are other municipalities that are in the same boat, municipalities in Benchita County that are in the same boat, there is a state law that allows municipalities to share the employee. So rather than you looking for a part-time and Pleasant, you looking for part-time and Pigram looking for part-time, you all could hire a full-time building inspector and state statute would specifically allow you all to do that whatever you all worked out as far as proportional costs and things like that. So that, that's I, something I we have... Is. To some degree, we've kind of done that, I think, in the past. Well, not really, though. I mean, it's sort of, it, it, we've used the same services, yes, I guess. The contractor that we use. Because, I mean, obviously, Pleasant View is probably going to use it more heavily than we are, uh, or people. So. And then you've also got now, the our, our current building inspector, Franklin, is under the supervision of the county mayor, mm -hmm. and county mayor supervised employees are now down to four days a week. Uh, they don't work on Fridays. So that further compresses your time period. Yeah, it is. And I, I think they've extended their hours to yeah, leave, but, yeah. but we've still got, you know, we've got they're four days that they're trying to get around to everybody in it um, now. So anyway, if that's at any all relevant to your decision making on this. And as to the observation, um, one of the frequent comments that we get from the public is the lack of response from the building inspector when they call for inspection. Their phone is overloaded and takes all of the messages it can take in less than a day. Right now, they have in excess of 2,100 permits out in the county, just in the county. Yeah, yeah, you're you're going to ask the city's building inspector. Just yeah, the that does not count the ones in Pleasant View, National City, or any of the other places. They're also doing inspections for Pegram. So Pegram is only one they're not doing is uh, Ashland City. Right. They're they're the one they're not doing. So what so Ashland City has a full-time building inspector. Yes. Well, they had one. He's now left. Uh, Alan, Alan Nicholson. I think I think no. oh, Alan's doing it now. Yeah. I know it was yeah. previous to Alan yeah. left. So that's common in the trade, so that you know. Uh, you can hire someone and train them. My experience in this field over the past several decades is as soon as you train them, they're going to go to a city full time because they get better pay and benefits. They're just going to leave. That's what happens. Can we so, hire uh, Alan part time? I don't know what Ashton's even in. I didn't think I should start. Alan is, if I'm not mistaken, he's in the fire department. Yes. And Ash, yeah, Ashland City started running theirs through the fire department because you know your your certifications are run under the state fire marshal law. They are, but the some of the certifications under the code requirements are not the same. And so we end up with a lot of some of the building codes that are cogent with just the training that we see as fire codes. That's been the experience in Kansas Springs twice um, with part-timers that they've had over the years here. There will be a focus on fire code and almost no constructive knowledge of building codes. And the building codes and the fire codes are the cogent, they're not the same thing. So they're inspecting for fire suppression and fire 
of the lack of buyers in the structure without inspecting the framing or the plumbing or the HVAC adequately meet the code. So we've had that issue as well. And this has been, as John said, an ongoing issue for the city. That's my time here in 2006. And without, once uh, we kind of seeded our permit and really inspections uh, more than anything else over to the county, the planners then uh, taken on multiple hats of, of reviewing permits uh, under the, uh, the custody umbrella of the county uh, and then uh, issuing permits as well as doing the planning position. Um, so th th that segregation of duties would, would of course be ideal. Um, but we don't have, uh, we don't have a line item for um, uh, a building inspector. So um, I'll need to get approval to hire a position that I don't have a line item for. So I don't know if uh, we need to set that out as a vote or- um, well, I think that that would also need to be something maybe to add to an agenda for next month as far okay. as adding a line item mm -hmm. uh, to look into even going through process of hiring a building inspector. And I certainly wouldn't want to make that decision Yep. Down to down to so okay. We'll put that on the uh, January agenda. Before we get to that January agenda, is there a way that you can talk to the other municipalities to see if there's an interest in maybe sharing? Yes, yes. And I've spoken with John Well and the paper uh, a few times as well about sharing um uh combining resources. So yeah, we talked to yeah, uh, there's other there's other things I'm thinking sewer. Yeah, even okay. another thing down the road we want to really talk to people about. Yeah. Um, um had some of those conversations with him already, but yes, yes, certainly would. And then um, uh, the other item is uh, uh, from the Regional Planning Commission uh, to advise the board to review and establish a process for communication between commissioners and staff. Um, I, I think this is has said that if uh, the commissioners have any questions or concerns about staff, then um, please direct them through me which for the most part is happening. However, the way that some of these inquiries come, um, I, I think could be changed. The, um, the best practice is that if any of you have any questions, if you're approached by a constituent and that constituent has any questions or concerns about activities of the staff, um, whether it be they saw one of the, the, the trucks speeding down the road, or they um, feel like they were agreed by uh, an action taken by a staff member, please ask me questions. Let me look into it and give me the opportunity to find information for you <laughs> rather than having a predetermined opinion about what's already happened and proceeding down a path of adversarial confrontation rather than just asking questions and let me give you the answers. If I don't have the answers, I'll find you the If I think it's better served for a particular staff member to contact you and give you those answers, then I'll ask that particular staff member to contact you and give you those answers. But I think the town is gonna to be best served if you have any questions, if someone has come to you that has concerns, please let me know. And I will try to get as much information to you as I possibly can on the front end. So you'll have a full array of data that you can then reflect. And it's always best to get both sides of the story. If I could interject, because I know that this is the elephant in the room that was addressed the other night where I didn't get to speak and say what I needed to say at the planning commission. I did just that, John, regarding the issue that the office is on the front front. There were no back doors. There, there, there was. I brought my concern to you as was man, you know, and I brought it to Martha Brooke because I knew the issue that was being discussed needed to be have discretion involved with it. And I did exactly what you said that I did. I would, dip, I would beg to differ. The difference is that if, in a general sense, if another commissioner has a constituent that has ask some questions or another constituent has built, they've been um, um, agreed by a, a staff member. That commissioner will contact me, ask me questions, try to get some information from the town's side of what happened, then relay that information back to the constituent. Um, or if there's additional information that they need, 
I'll find that additional information. Again, I'll ask the staff member to contact that commissioner if that's what's needed. But information is gathered first. In this particular case and some others, I receive a letter. Accusations are made. Sides are drawn. The staff and the town of Kingston Springs is accused of doing something without the full array of information at the disposal. That's the difference between the May two situations. I just I disagree with your way of looking at it. I brought an issue to you. There were no accusations made. I said in one sentence, I didn't lay it out in the email because I knew discretion was needed. I sent it to you. I didn't hear from anyone for four days. And I, it's not up to me to look into the issue, especially for what was being raised. I am not an investigator. That was up to you to look into. And I didn't, you didn't even get, I guess, the story of what I had been told for 10 days. I did not meet with you and Mark Brooke for 10 days. In the interim, you called the other party and talked with her without even talking to the other people, without talking, you hadn't talked to me yet. You never talked, no one's ever talked to the, 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 the community members that are involved. The I information I received they, from you was a violate, potential violation of a Fourth Amendment right. Potential. Yes. yes. There was Which, no so maybe it that's was, leveling of an accusation. It's a, Perhaps we're, made, we're playing that semantics, that's but that's the way it reads to me. look at and Mark and Brooke to look at. The difference. The word potential and possible. I did say okay. it had occurred. Semantics. No. The no, difference no, is that. Ms. Mark and Brooke, is there a difference between potential? Potential. A and potential violation and a violation occurred. Yes, oh, there's a you. technical legal difference. Thank you. But the tone in which it's prefaced, I think there may be an interpretational issue with that um, mention. So but, I think that's what you're driving at. But yes. I come from the legal world, world. I knew the legal technicality difference. That's why I used the word potential. Yes. And there were no back doors. I, you know, and you had actually had knowledge of this from somebody else who we previous to my style with this. So there was no request on my side for information. That's, I, I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to turn it over to you as a mandated reporter for the city to look at. Mm -hmm. and it's we not did. up to me. You've never talked to the people. I believe there are multiple conversations. Yeah, so there are multiple with staff. Speaking about, with that issue? about that issue. Mm -hmm. yeah, about the the the. I guess the perceived violation of an amendment right yes i don't know when that occurred no, but that's pretty good property owners with staff right but you yes. never talk with the people that get their side of the story excluding me from it i don't need to be involved at this point i turned it over to you right that's when somebody investigates and looks at both sides not me yes i'm not the investigator so i did what i was supposed to do I don't know what else I could have done. Again, the information that I received from you, in my interpretation of that information, it was allegations against the town of Kingston Springs, wrongdoing, without requesting the side of the story of I the town. I requested a meeting. I requested to talk to you. It took 10 days for anyone to talk to me. I, I requested to talk. Okay. I, I, I just like you know, I mean, in my in my my experience, I, mean, I can't imagine. It. I've never experienced an instance where it's taken that long to talk to John. I uh, usually I just call him and he answers the phone. And so you call him. I asked him to call me. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Well, I think we were also coordinating schedules. I also wanted to get a full on the files as well. When a an amendment right is violated or the suggestion that an amendment right was violated, that to me is a very serious matter. It is. So that's why we were, the accusation was that staff violated someone's fourth amendment right. Potentially. Okay. Potentially violated someone's fourth amendment right. A serious accusation. Mm -hmm. Again, an accusation. 
without just the point I'm trying to make is it's simple to just pick up the phone or send a text or an email that just says, hey, what happened here? Can I get your side of the story? Can I get the town side of the story? But that's not what happened. That's not how it works. What do you mean it's not how it works? That's As a funny. mandated reporter, if I, somebody tells me, who's a mandated reporter? Commissioners here. Which is the the Constitution. The Fourth Amendment is one of the constitutional rights of yeah. privacy in one's home. We all took an oath to that. So I take that seriously. That's why I turned it over to someone else, not me. John's coming about your communication with him. You can always approach John. You can always call him. I did. So you and you asked him to call you. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. So next. I contacted him in the manner in which I always contact John. John, how many times have I ever called you in the last two years? Maybe twice. I always contact. I always contact you. But we communicate by emails like this. Can be talked to easily and settle things without all this semantics. All this could be handled quite quickly with a phone call. I've said this to you so many times. Just call John. Just call John. You get all the facts, all the figures, all the information. But you spend so much time. I'm, I'm in awe of the time you spend putting in these great habits, which it's just could have been, you know, it's handled so fast. Glenn, I do that. I respond in writing. So it's good that I let you know that I have a chronic illness which leads me to put my thoughts in writing rather than speak them i have a problem with extemporaneous speaking that's why i put it in writing and i will always do that got me through my legal career that is the way i operate i'm sorry if it's not the way you operate that is the way i do it yes thank you evident you go on and on about things that just simply could be handled so efficiently and quickly by a call. John, yes. where we're at. John, that's one. That was a code's complaint. That is not, I didn't send it John to put on the agenda. That was a code's complaint. It's so, a call with a lawyer? No, that, that's a code's complaint. That was, but we're talking about two you, No, things. no, you're, you're leaving. I'm just using this as an example of your energies that you put towards something where it be handled in just a phone call. Energies which you've taken all of our time tonight, which could be handled with just a phone call. So many things we've happened over the last two years. It is the end of the phone call. Glenn, I'm a different commissioner than you. Oh, I was totally aware of that. We used to love coming to these meetings, but now it's just been such a dread because of what comes forth and the waste of time and energy and the energy that you bring forth. And it's just been a constant attack to the city. I don't understand your thought pattern of that. Um, we are well, commissioners, I, we are fingers on a hand. I all think, the time. Maybe the uh, this is qualifies a verbal attack. And, and just a minute, please. I think the proper way to move forward here is to come to an agreement on how we're going to handle issues and come issues and, and constituent complaints. So, this is just a plan. Can I, can I, I, wait, I, let me finish, okay? Let me finish, please. So, if, if we all agree that we ought to, first of all, bring those forward. When a, when a constituent has a, an issue, bring it through John to say, John, here's here is the, the side of the story from the constituent. This is what I'm getting from them. Um, please look into this and let's let's hear both sides of the story before we make a judgment or write a letter or make an accusation. Let's hear both sides of the story. I mean, that's always the best way to do it because what you find is when you hear both sides of the story. You get a much more balanced picture. I've got my point of view. Todd's going to have his. We may not agree, but whoever's going to make a judgment about it or advocate for or against it at least needs to hear what Todd's viewpoint is and what my viewpoint is. And in John's case, he needs to be the point of contact. Uh, now, if he's not responsive, then that's you know that's a different issue. But I've never found John to be not responsive. I've never found John. Uh, so I think if we can come to agreement that that's how we're going to handle things, we're 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 not going to go ready fire aim. We're going to go ready aim fire. Uh, let's get both sides and let's go through the city manager and give him the first shot. Now, if we're not satisfied with what John's got to say about it or his investigation into it, then 
That's a different issue. Now that comes before this body. It should come to the whole board. Right, right. to the whole board. Exactly. And, and, you know, that, that to me appears, to, that's the way I've operated on my first term, the way I plan to operate in my second term, um, or any of those beyond that. Um, I'm so lucky to live that long. So the point being that let, let's, let's agree to be agreeable. Let's let's make sure we follow the process, mm -hmm. and and let's make sure that we hear both sides of the story before we start firing bullets. That makes sense. That's what I'm asking. I just, I just have a question yeah. from a department head standpoint. To me, if a citizen comes and addresses a commissioner, the first step should be encouraging that citizen to call the city manager and let that citizen and the city manager try to work it out. And then if they don't get any satisfaction, they come back to you and it comes before the board. But I don't understand why if a citizen comes and complains about an issue from any department or something going on, why is it that the person that has the complaint, you're gonna get the straight story much clearer from the person that has the complaint than by the time it goes through a commissioner and then John. And I just, I really, as a department head, I would appreciate if you, you know, ask them to contact John, let him know the issues, and then he can get with staff and find out what the, set, the story is. And then if that constituent's not happy with what John has to say, they can always come back to you and you can bring it before the board. But um, I, I just, to me, the, the people in the town that have concerns shouldn't just bring it to one commission. Um, because we are a city manager form of government, I feel like that they should be encouraged Step one, contact the city manager. Ask him, tell him your side of what's going on. He is, I'm sure John would check in whatever the issue was, it was the employee or, or however it occurred, and then get back with them. And then if they weren't satisfied, I can understand. But I think that's kind of for department heads. That's discouraging for me. If someone has a complaint about something one of the police officers have done, to me, they can call John and John can address me. I can look into it. I can get John the answers. He can get back to that person that's complaining. Or if they would rather just talk to me, John can just inform me that this citizen has a complaint on Someone on your department or something, how they was treated on the call, can you call? But I just think that would simplify a lot of things and a lot of mix-ups in communication. I think we're all saying the same thing. The problem, the problem is, is this discussion, so this all derives from a complaint or from, from something that happened in the Planning Commission. And, and I know a lot of the Planning Commission probably didn't make it through that whole package. It took me a long time. I think my printer was like smoking by the time it got done printing because it was about that thick. 160 pages. 160 pages. Thank you. Yes, it was quite, quite voluminous. Um, and I don't know that the communication somehow in that meeting it turned into a communication thing, but I, I, and I mean, not I feel like maybe some people did not have a full grasp of what the content of the packet was because that wasn't really what the issue was. I mean, yeah, that's how we need to communicate. I think actually everybody here does communicate that way to some degree, like, um, you know, uh, I make phone calls, Carolyn writes letters. I mean. Todd might choose carrier pigeons and that'd be fine too. Uh, it might be less efficient, but you know, it'd be one way to communicate. But I think that where the issue came in and what the issue was on the planning commission uh, agenda was actually more about interference with the day-to-day -day work of the city staff. And that's where I think we're, we're running into an issue with on, and this was a particular code case, 
where the board planning commission made a recommendation to the board of zoning appeals because these, this applicant went to the boarding or submitted an application to the board of zoning appeals. And that application basically was for appeals that the board of zoning appeals really can't grant anyway, even if they wanted to, because it violates state law. Am I correct in this, Martha? Yeah, yeah, there are some, some things so, that can't be. I know that the staff had communicated with this applicant and told them a way forward to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish, uh, at least as much of the as much of it as they could within the uh, confines of our zoning ordinance and our building codes and all of those sorts of things. And it's much the same situation as we dealt with tonight. Uh, it was a similar situation. They had a finished basement. I mean, and they came on, they came to this property, they realized they had a finished basement that was not on the tax record, much like we dealt with tonight by waiving that fine. I believe we also waived the fine for this individual for the same reason. I'm not positive. We, we made that recommendation. Right, no, that recommendation has been made to the way this fee as well for them because of the same thing. And I think the issue is really the fact that through staff, they were receiving the advice of a process to accomplish what they wanted to do as closely as possible, and perhaps they received some bad advice to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals, which is not going to help them accomplish what they want to do, and probably going to set them back. I know that, I believe that if they fail in the Board of Zoning Appeals, that can actually set them back an entire year, because if they get rejected, I don't believe they can return for 12 calendar months past that date. So I think that the issue is less about how we communicate, but the role of us as commissioners, we make decisions here in this board. The planning commission makes decisions as that board, as a body. We have our planning commissioner chairman there. I'm sorry we're keeping you up so late, Mike. I think you go to bed a little earlier than this. A lot, a lot earlier, but that's fine. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that's where the issues lie. I believe we've had similar issues in the police department uh, where, you know, as commissioner, our employee is John. John is our employee. I think John does a great job. He has my support 100% personally, and that's my position as commissioner. Uh, you guys I want to have different opinions of John. I hope they're similar to mine because I think he's doing a very good job managing uh, oftentimes very stressful situations. And when we as commissioners interfere in the day-to-day -day operations, because we do not oversee the staff of the town of Kingston Spring, they do not oversee the staff of the town of Kingston Spring. If we have a problem with how the staff is functioning, we address those issues to John. And we have such an absurdly big problem with how those issues are being addressed, then I mean, not that I would want to do this because I just said I did it. We could we can send John packing and my time being mayor, I've done that once. Uh, and it wasn't a pleasant situation, but it was a matter of we had to do it, and 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 so that that happened. But I think that's where the rub is. That's where the issues are. May I interject again? Yeah. yeah. I just find it hard to being told, being told I interfered somehow. Martha, Brooke, and John know what I sent them. They know the questions I asked them. They know that there was a meeting that was going to be set up between Sharon and I and the, the people and Mark and Brooks said that we, we would resolve it all. And I said that would be that. I, I don't, I don't but, know but, that. But I'm, I'm, I'm like I can talk. Absolutely. Thank you. That was going to be set up. And I think that would have led to resolution mm -hmm. if that meeting had, had helped because I said to Mark and Brooks when we spoke, I'm an advocate. Sharon's not warm and fuzzy, and she had had me on the phone for an hour and explained to me what all the ramifications were between the findings of the zoning and the plan and the and the codes, and that was going to take care of it. And that was a month ago, but it's like all these machinations occurred. That meeting did not occur, and it led to this. And it, it almost seems like this was what it was supposed to lead to instead of getting it resolved. If we'd had that meeting with the people on November 9th, like. Like we talked about doing. So it's just cost. I believe that well, yeah, that, but that is that is a staff. I, I think the issue is I mean, I is the fact that 
I don't know that a petitioner is in a position to act as an advocate in a meeting talking about the staff issues. You are one of the house. All five of us have to be there. You have, all have some superpower that makes you stronger than the rest of us and have more powers. We are a team. We are a board. We have to all five of us make a decision at once. You don't get to just do what you want. I'm not doing what I want. I was asked by this situation. We're not going to get anywhere, Glenn, because... I sat and watched a YouTube video of you standing right there last week. Are you familiar with what? I mean, I don't see you having any issues speaking your mind, speaking what you feel. Um, it should be handled so differently. The chairman of the planning commission, I believe you wanted to interject yeah. something real quickly. Yes, and I, this is just a fundamental thing. Um, I used to work a lot with communication within organizations. I was a trained inspector general in the Army for a time. So what we used to do was, if you want to report what you think is a problem, in this case to John, or any of you, I recommend you report the fundamental thing without characterizing. John, I have a constituent who believes a staff member forced themselves into their home without their permission, if that's the case. Can you look into that? That way, it's a fundamental, specific thing, and John can look into that versus, I believe we have a Fourth Amendment uh, rights violation. John, um, we have a couple constituents who have complained that they're being harassed by police officers on East Kingston Springs Road. Better to say, John, I have two people have contacted me, said they were going way below the speed limit and were pulled over. That's a specific thing versus a large statement using big words. So I would recommend keep everything to the fundamental as it was reported. And, and the meetings can go a lot more smoothly in um, the investigation. So that's all, just for communication. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Commissioner, uh, Sharon, did you have something you'd like to interject? Very brief observation. I think that sitting down with the applicants and John and Martha Brooks is not an issue for me. Offer to do so. My concern is that a sitting commissioner is launching allegations, and they're allegations, regardless of the discussion, the, the debate about the use of a particular word. This has happened in five occasions in the last couple of years. At that point, it becomes not a staff resolution with a city manager, with an applicant. It becomes a staff resolution or attempt to seek a resolution with a city attorney, with a city manager and the applicants and a city commissioner who does not, does not contribute anything that results in a positive outcome from the applicant or from the staff. This happened previously. A great deal of noise was focused on it, resulted in the exact same outcome. You can't live in a storage shed. That's where it stuck. I, I want to speak. Everyone else has spoken. I didn't get to speak at the planning commission. You may that. speak okay. if you it, I, it's, it's okay. again. Uh, this is part of the issue is that you can't express or fully answer questions. And I have discussed this at length with John. I have submitted questioning by the city attorney on this particular case, which is now stayed because there's a board of zoning appeals action filed on, which stays all action. I can't meet with them if I want to, even though I did so less than a week after I visited the property from an anonymous complaint. I sat down with the applicant and his contractor gave them the steps forward. And then it halted again because someone filed something with a city manager out with an allegation contained in it, an accusation contained in it. I followed the process, but there is no process by which your staff should be sitting in another situation that I endured on the Patterson case with the sitting commissioner where we were screamed at, yelled at, voices got raised, nothing got solved. The issue was not an issue of access to the property, regardless of what people say. It wasn't. 
It was an issue of living in a shed that you can't occupy for safety reasons and instructing that applicant who at that time expressed absolutely no distress at all when we were there. We sat down with them and gave them the path forward. It's the same thing with this applicant. I met with him at City Hall prior to the sewer public hearing that you had in the discussion. No stress was relayed. The only thing that was relayed to me was by the contractor who said he told me he had permits. This is a person who proceeded without permits. There are consequences for those actions. As to the allegation that I violated somebody's Fourth Amendment rights, he was at that point desperate to show me that he at least attempted to get permits, so he invited me in to look at the half-finished permits. Once you enter the house, there's another code violation staring me in the face because he's working inside the house without a permit. So again, I've heard everything from you violated some of these Fourth Amendment rights to you shouldn't be doing this job or you should sit down with the commissioner who's making the allegation with the applicant in the same room to resolve the issue. None of that is appropriate. It just isn't. I am perfectly happy to answer John's questions, and I did. And I think for this board's edification, my, re my feedback from John is that he has complete confidence in the way I do my job and the way I approach it. And I do this hundreds of times without any repercussion. Occasionally, there's an applicant who does not like being cited or told what they need to do. But we've resolved this same issue dozens of times in this town. As a matter of fact, we voted tonight to relieve the fine for one of them. So it happens all the time. So again, it is inappropriate for me to sit down with a sitting commissioner in front of applicants who have an issue on the table that needs to be resolved. We also have in that packet, I'm going to finish where I started, Mr. Clark. If they want me to stop, they'll interrupt me. The level of disrespect that's been visited on staff through this process is, is untold. I've expended 45 and a half hours of my time to respond to this process at a cost to your taxpayers. Legal fees, I think, are even going to be higher than that in response to this allegation that was unfounded. That's my position. That's been my position from the outset. I documented my visit to the property the day that I did it in the system, as I always do. Told the city manager what occurred at that time in real time, and then responded to questions from the city attorney and to the city manager. And that's the position that we are in. It is difficult to do the job that we do anyway, everyone who works for the city. It is twice difficult to do it with these sorts of allegations. And they're starting to surface again with a golf club violation. It's that constant interference in the day-to-day -day things that we need to do to resolve the problem. And the allegations that we're not doing our job when we're doing every single thing we can to do our job. So I don't know how this commission wishes to deal with this, but from my perspective, it's planning issue that was resolved in the planning commission the other night, was it not? If someone has a planning issue, they come to the planning commission. What they don't do is write letters and then ask staff to respond to that outside of the planning commission. I am a due process open meeting person. And if you have a complaint, bring it out loud, just like the golf club tonight. I will address it out loud because I think the public has a right to know. And there's no, it shouldn't be addressed any other way, any other way than in here. If it I has to do with building inspections, or permitting or stop work orders should be dealt with in here after it's been reviewed by the, if there's still a question after the city manager handles it. If it's planning, go to the planning commission. That's all I have to say, but this is, as you might imagine, this is becoming taxing for your staff. Once again, I'll reiterate, the complaint was brought to me. I sent it to John and it was a 
issue that I knew needed discretion, and I knew that any communication between Mark Brook and I would be privileged, so I include her in on the email. That is what I did. And I that's what I did. And everybody's telling me that that's what we, what we should do, bring it to John. That's what I did. I brought it to John. That's I, what I did. I apologize. I don't mean to be rude. But again, this demonstrates the issue. Yeah, I'm yeah, not it's, addressing it's, it's, Mr. Clark. I'm addressing the commitment. Please. So again, these conversations should take place in the chain of command. It's like everything else. It's not military. But you have the same process in place. You address that person. This debate is harmful to everybody involved. I tried to test this. So it should be handled exactly as the city manager has said. And I don't think this is productive in this manner. So all I'm trying to do here and all the planning commission is trying to do here is seek clarification for who's going to direct me. How many supervisors do I have? How many people do I listen to? Who do I report to? Who do I respond to? Because as it is right now, there's a wide variant different opinion of who that is. And if I could jump in for clarification, coming out of the planning commission, again, I participated via telephone about COVID last week. Um, so I wasn't there in person, but I to hear all the conversation and participate on the project. As I pointed out last week, this goes back to the convoluted ways that we do things here. Ms. Armstrong wears several different hats. She wears a hat as the city planner. She is, serves at their pleasure and is answerable to them. She also works under the auspices of issuing permits and codes enforcement to some extent through coming downstream from our building inspector, which falls under John. John's supervision. So if there is a complaint relative to her actions in that capacity, it goes to John. If there is a complaint relative to her actions as city planner, zoning related, concept reviewed, et cetera, that goes through planning commission. She goes straight to her chair there and then he could determine what to do from that. So that was the nexus of what I was trying to draw home at the planning commission last week. In fact, I, I was the one that suggested, let's let this be the motion instead of what was actually before the planning commission. Um, you know, let's let's look at the fact that we are asking one person with very different lenses that they're looking at projects through and different people that they report to. We're asking that same person to address a multitude of issues, and it does get very confusing about how it's going to be addressed. But that was what I was trying to drop on the planning commission meeting last week, uh, and this is what has come to me out of that conversation. I think if you all get an independent building inspector that can address some of these types of issues that may mediate some of the confusion about where concerns, comments, and kudos to use the expression from my group, make the There are two problems with that finding the money to pay one and finding one that wants to do it for the amount we're going to pay. I hear you. I hear you. That's the two problems. I don't think it's a, des a desire not to have this or issue that. Yeah, it's it's an ongoing issue that a town that has very very small towns that always face. I mean, there's only so much you know, need for one, but there is a need for one. Airview. Uh, well, we're under the municipalities. Oh, uh, Airview would be. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what Airview. Airview. I mean, I, I don't suppose it has to be in the county. We could probably look at other places yeah. the county. So you have special things to individual planning commission recommendation by the board of commissioners. The process for being completed and That's what I was going to ask. Is there, I've seen the book, I haven't been sworn in yet, I haven't dove in. Is there a process that we as commissioners should be following legally to code? No, there is not a specifically outlined process. You, as the commissioner, as I mentioned, you're vested with authorities. That's where you come in and do all your votes. 
concerns that you have about anything be it of your own volition yeah. um or if a constituent has mentioned something to you that goes to john and yeah. and as the mayor previously pointed out if it's something in writing if it's like a phone call or if you're going to use carrier vision mm -hmm. that's fine figure out what works for you mm -hmm. um and you know and, and understand too as you're getting into this new you probably have gotten a little taste of this on the planning commission and you are going to have people that approach you uh constituents that approach you that are going to have their own best interest at heart yep. you represent the entire town and the constituencies of all the town as well so you, know, you need to understand that any actions that you do will have ramifications not just for that person but for everybody absolutely be it how many tax dollars are spent to address an issue to how many tax dollars are spent to do whatever you're going to do on streets or you know if you want to have a beautification project or whatever Exactly. So, you know, look at it with, with that lens. But no, there is not a detailed, it has to be in this format. Okay. Um, and that's maybe something I know this planning commission was talking about. That's was part of this conversation, was trying to find a way that, hey, this is the acceptable way, this is not the acceptable way to move forward. Because right. I think we need to find that on this board or we're going to continue to have these conversations. Well, and each and every one of you look at this and i've had these conversations with some of you look at this with different lenses you all have strength and skills that you bring to this board um which is great given the myriad of things that you all have to make decisions on and look at and the amount of information you have to absorb and, and spit back out in some cases and constituents ask questions or be ready to make a decision on um, you know, and so you all come at it from a different approach. You all have different philosophies with how to represent your constituents as well. Um, and so, you know, you just need to be aware, you know, whatever manner you choose to represent, you're an elected official. So you, you have been chosen to represent your constituents, whatever manner that you represent those constituents in, just remember that you also represent all the constituencies and not just one or two which is yeah Hello. and then whatever format of communication works best for you yeah. does that answer yeah, that's question? my question i want to make sure yeah and then one more thing and in, in, in reference to miss armstrong there have been times like bringing this complaint to john about this but there have been myriad times when i've been approached by constituents who have said i had a real problem i was told this was the sprinkler system i was told this and this and this and I look it up, I send it to them. Yep, yeah, she's right. That's what you need to do. Here's the ordinance. And I've done that myriad times that y'all don't know about. I'm a letter writer. I can show you the letter that I've written to constituents saying, yep, yeah, that, that's right. That's correct. Here's a copy of our ordinance. Um, so these times I do, it's 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 not that I do things willy-nilly whatsoever. And maybe if I could, I don't know, put a cap on this or not, but Maybe it's, the, about yeah, sure maybe it's the the, the message um rather than rather than a letter that it looks like from you know it could be taken from my perspective that there is you know uh, again an accusation has been made sides have already been chosen lines have been drawn um to as mike more succinctly and better put it than, than than I did or ever could that that information that is presented to me from anyone that is more open-ended as in I heard this from a constituent this is the information that I'm receiving from them could you please investigate um, because it seems like someone has an issue and just leave it at that not going any farther that um somebody told me this and i've done this and this and this and i believe this and this and this were the the thoughts and decisions and preconceptions have already been laid whether it's so it's still open-ended as in i've received this information please investigate i think that's agreeable i just you know my background is having to co-own a law enforcement training company so Fourth Amendment issues are up front. I come from last 10 years of my career doing civil rights for plaintiffs and defendants. So 
that's why that language comes easy to me. That's I'm sure. so if I understand what Mike's point is, that's, that's a good point. And what you all, as commissioners, have to remember too is that anytime you provide an answer to a constituent, especially if it's one that they want, if it's the answer that they want to hear, y'all are going to need. You know, like letters and screen, the Ten Commandments, y'all from your assignment. This is the gospel truth. You're the expert on that, et cetera. If you have made a mistake in your analysis from providing that answer, then that becomes problematic. So I just want to caution you all, you know, that's why I rely on the resources that you rely upon us to here's here's this question that's come up. I kind of think I know the answer, but can you get back with this citizen and let us address it that way? You know, rather than, yeah. oh, you know, here's everything to you know something. So, you know, I, I think you need to keep that in mind too. So. Well, I, I think that actually ended up actually being somewhat productive. So, thank you all. Uh, but I think that, uh, oh, we still actually amazingly There's enough have more of this agenda. There's yeah. more guys. <laughs> I know that's hard to, hard to wrap. Yeah, now. It's only H. Well, H was the last thing there, but we still do have to uh, do the very important duty of uh, discarding these two pieces of fire hose. So, <laughs> motion to discard. Do we have a, no, we have a motion. Do we have a second? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the reminders are City Hall will be closed Friday tomorrow for a staff luncheon. I you all enjoy. And uh, December 19th for uh, recognition of the, or sorry, case, or I'll just read it. Sorry, I'm tired. Monday, December 19th, Town of Kings and Springs along the surrounding communities will be recognized by Chief County Commission for work and dedication related to the tornadoes that hit uh, uh, Cheatham County on December 11th, 2021. Um, and then City Hall will be closed Friday, December 23rd, and Monday, December 26th for the Christmas holiday, and of course on the 2nd of January for the new year. So, and do we have a motion to adjourn? No, 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 you're no, 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 I was invited with five o'clock on Monday, five thirty on Monday. Uh, Everybody's meeting. Five nine. Well, we all have to actually have a meeting after yeah, the elections. Okay. Uh, theoretically, you all could get sworn in any old time as yeah. long as you can. If you can just go trace down Harry and just tell him, "Hey, swear me in." I'll call the first right. thing in the morning. Or if Judge Massey's around tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or. Mary said she'd be happy, or Representative Little said she'd be happy for you too. So, yeah, I like no to be there. people. Yeah. I'm available Monday. If you can find somebody. Monday, the. Monday will be the. Monday, Monica. Monday, Monica. Monday, the 19th. Um, I can do. Uh, I can do tomorrow, too. Okay. Well, well, uh, I think I have to be somewhere tomorrow. I think. And the person that I have to be there with is back there, and I don't think she'd like it if I'm not there. So, well, tomorrow afternoon. Oh, tomorrow afternoon. We got a meeting in the morning, and I'm open after 10 o'clock all the way in the morning. And then what about everyone else in there? Maybe if you do it early, then I can not get any time on that. I've got another pumpkin. I got to be uh, at 5 o'clock. So, I'm, so I'm not available to watch the name of the other They're having that. I could be back by. Oh, that's right. The city hall will be tomorrow. Why don't we just go with Monday if that works for everybody? I'll figure out. I don't know. Tuesday. Anytime after anytime after four. And that gives us some time if we have to in between. Like we don't know what the schedule of perspective people that are going to be where you win are. So we have to like have a little buffer, I think, for we can't be like Joe Perry, let's do it tomorrow at lunch. So I can do it that kind of that day except yeah. one to three. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Oh, it's Tuesday at five o'clock. I would be there at six p.m. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Tuesday at six. Tuesday at six. I might come and running close because I gotta join up with somebody that one. Yeah. should be fairly <laughs> uh, my card just real quick. If I could get um um uh, either Judge Maxi or uh Mayor McCarver here tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, would you be available? Yeah. Make some time yeah. more I swear in at least. Or Representative Little's, and I mean, I think she might be with you. I mean, I texted her and she thought she'd be honored. So yeah, it, it should take about a minute. We do it tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. But I'd like to go ahead and as soon as possible get you guys sworn in. So it doesn't happen like so that. Yeah. yeah, so we're just available tomorrow. Yeah. 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 But I've got a out of, out of here by 3 30, 4 o'clock. So it's going to have to be with I'll shoot for like two. Okay. Okay. Right. Yes. Do we have a motion to recess until 6 p.m. on Tuesday, December 19th? Okay. Oh, dude, sorry. 19th was Monday. I was still thinking Monday. Yes. Okay. And we have a second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We're all good. All right.